And uh, he's going to lead us in our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, I pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If you remain standing, we have our invocation from Rupert Vega, our police chaplain. And thank you for that, uh, Manuel Rivera, for the Pledge of Allegiance. Please go ahead. Will you please bow our heads? Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you today giving you honor and glory and praise. Lord, you are the source of all that is good, and we are grateful for all the blessings that you've bestowed upon us. We thank you for this wonderful city of Santa Ana, our honorable mayor, city council, chief of police and staff. We thank you for our freedom and the opportunity to gather together this day. We ask for your hand of blessing to be upon tonight's meeting and proceedings. We thank you for your unending love and wisdom and we ask that you would guide and direct our meeting and that it be of sound wisdom and that it be productive and with respect towards one another. Thank you, Lord, for helping us to accomplish our work and our goals this day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Cecilia Aguinaldo, if you could please step forward at this time. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Standing to my right is Cecilia Aguinaldo, and she has served on the Orange County Vector Control Board, representing Santa Ana. Uh, for five years. Uh, prior to that, um, she was on the Human Relations Commission for about four years, and uh, she's very, very active here in the community. She has an Associate of Arts degree from Santa Ana College. She was born in Jalisco, Mexico, and she immigrated to the United States in 1978. She's lived in Santa Ana more than 40 years with her husband, Armando Aguinawa, and uh, she and her uh, two sons, Ransme and Alan, and she has a daughter, Sylvia. And I know Sylvia particularly well. She used to babysit for us a few years ago when my kids were, were little, little kids. Uh, Cecilia, it doesn't say a lot about hobbies. I think you just work all the time is what you do, right? Exactly. She works all the time. But look, she's also served on the Lions Club of Santa Ana. She was the first woman president in their 85-year history. She also served as president, vice president, and parliamentarian, historian, ways and means. And she's a currently an active member of the PTA Council for the Santa Unified School District. She also served on the, on the Lions Club. And she's just, uh, you know, very, very active, a very positive person. And I'd like for her to say a few words, and I'm going to present her uh, recognition here. Good evening, um, Mayor Polito, members of the council, city manager Cabazos, Madam Secretary Maria Guizar, and staff, city staff. I would like to thank you for your support during my five years in the Orange County Vector Control, and for also thinking about me, recognizing all the hard work I have done in this commission. I also would like to thank my friends and family who are sitting down up there, who took time out of their busy schedule to be here with me on this special occasion, Mr. Mayor. Now, having the responsibility to representing the city of Santa Ana in different boards and commissions, is not about just go to the meetings and get the state being or whatever. It's about listening to the problems that we face, come back, to our city and look for the resources to solve the problems of our constituents of Santa Ana. This is what I have been down for 36 years since I came to this city. 
I'm very proud to be here and to be part of my city of Santa Ana. Um, I'm very honored to represent you, the city council, Mr. Mayor, and to accept this recognition. I'm looking forward to serving you and this board again or any other commission that you may need my help. My track record speaks for itself. I'm looking forward to hear from you. Thank you so much and thank you all of you. And I will always be at your service. My name is well known and advocate for parents to help the kids. Thank you. And Cecilia, this is a certificate of recognition awarded to you for your invaluable services to the Orange County Vector Control Board from November 15, 2010 through January 19, 2016. Congratulations thank and thank you very much. Thank you. Now I want to see um, Rob Richardson and Rob, Ron May, if you could like get up and walk around here. I think you're going to say some words. There's a lot of history walking up here right now. Um, Ron uh, was first elected to the city council back in 1986, and he served with me for, uh, you know, for eight years. At, at once upon a time, he and uh, Rob actually ran against each other, more history. Um, and now they're friends, and they're coming up here, and they're going to talk about um, a beautiful, beautiful uh, project that they're embarked upon. And, uh, uh, you know, they both uh, have done tremendous service for this community. Let me turn it over. Welcome. Thank you, sir. Welcome. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the council, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm Rob Richardson here along with Ron May. And we're here for a very important purpose tonight. And we're going to be assisted by Julie, who is going to be holding a poster for an upcoming event that will take place at Santa Ana High School. On February 20th at 7.30 p.m., there will be a Bill Medley concert in the Bill Medley Auditorium at Santa Ana High School. Tickets are going to be available uh, and are available now for $40 each. We encourage everybody to take part in this great event. The proceeds are going to benefit the Dollars for Scholars organization at Santa Ana High School. So it's supporting scholarships. And Bill Medley has generously given of his time. I believe this is the fourth or fifth time that we've had a Bill Medley concert at Santa Ana High School. And Bill is a native son. And somehow or another, he was able to leave Santa Ana High School. He didn't get his degree until one of our concerts where we gave him an honorary diploma from the school. But he comes back and he supports this Santa Ana community and supports the young people. And uh, it's just an honor to be here with Ron May because Ron, along with myself, we each served on the city council. We each graduated from Santa Ana High School. But Ron went to school with Bill Medley. And so now I'd like to ask Ron to step up and say a little bit about Bill. Then we're going to give you some details about the concert and we're going to encourage you to all be there. Put your hands together for Ron May. I've got a side note before we start the pitch. Mayor Polito and I came on the council in the fall of 86. The big sent in a register, not Orange County at the time, was Ace Muffler. And the Polito family was bound and determined that the Santa Ana Redevelopment Agency with money from Washington, D.C., was not going to condemn their ace muffler shop. So he got glaring and blaring headlines for weeks and weeks and weeks at that time. He comes on the council with me. I'm about 46, and he was about 14 at the time. <laughs> We're talking 29 years ago. And Miguel and I were the rookies, but I was a 46-year-old, and he was just barely past his teenage years. So I've known him for a long period of time, and he's served this community and as well as his family for many, many years. And he's just uh, been a real beacon of light for the city of Santa Ana.
I have a Bill Medley jacket on. It's the Righteous Brothers, and I have their signature. I was thinking about auctioning it off, but uh, I really have enough money to meet my bill, so I won't. So I'm going to show you his jacket. Yeah. And his partner, Bobby Hatfield, is now deceased, but I happened to get this jacket because Bill and I grew up in South Santa Ana together. We both went to Lathrop, Santa Ana High. He went to Spurgeon Elementary, and I went to Lowell Elementary. Spurgeon's now intermediate. Lathrop was a junior high. So as sophomores at Santa Ana High School, we knew each other at Lathrop, but we became friends at Santa Ana High School. And at that time, uh, his A-plus was music and English and the rest were not so good. So he ends up going to a beauty academy on North Broadway called Bartmore Beauty Academy. And at that place, he has a girlfriend from the Logan Vario, and her name is Lupi Laguna. So he writes a song named Little Latin Loopy Lou. And at that time, there was a Gracie's record shop on North Broadway, about 3rd and Broadway at the time. And KRLA was the big station in LA. And this was the beginning of rock and roll in the late 50s, early 60s. They would call down to Santa Ana because Santa Ana was the capital of the county and it was the hub of Orange County at the time. And they would say, well, what are you playing down there? say, well, we're playing a song called Little Aunt Loopy Lou, and we've sold 1,500 this week. Well, LA has sold three. So that promoted them from Gracie's Record Shop in Santa Ana to the big time, KRLA, up in LA. And at that time, you could go to RCA and the other record companies and just walk in off the street and, and give them your material. Well, he had hooked up with Bobby Hatfield from Anaheim, Bill Medley from Santa Ana, Hatfield from Anaheim, they first were the Paramours, the Romancers and the Paramours, and then they became the Righteous Brothers because El Toro Marine Base was not too far from us, and they would come in on the weekends into Santa Ana, and there was a place on the corner of Chestnut and Main called John's Black Derby. The front of it was John's Malt Shop. Well, the Righteous Brothers, which were playing in John's Black Derby, were named that because the black servicemen would come in, and they would go to the... Black, Der Black Derby, because you were over 21, and they would sing rhythm and blues, some gospel, rock and roll, and the blacks would look at blue-eyed soul, and they would say, that's a Righteous Brother. So that's how their name stuck, is the Righteous Brothers. At that time, they went to Hollywood, and they had made a couple of albums. They went to England, the albums now, and the Beatles garage bands at the time played their albums when they came to America in 64 they asked the Righteous Brothers to open for them which they did then the Rolling Stones came and Keith Richards asked if they would open for the Rolling Stones well they'd been offered a host for the show called Shindig now American Bandstand was was before Soul Train so there's American Bandstand nightly and then weekly there's Shindig the Righteous Brothers hosted Shindig for a couple of years. And that, of course, gave them national fame because it was ABC Channel 7 throughout the nation. Well, this is early TV, and of course, everything is 45, 78s were already passe, but 45 records. records right? Yeah, they're records, yeah. Uh, for sure. <laughs> and of course, at that time, no computers, etc. So the Righteous Brothers become monstrous hits because they have a producer by the name of Phil Spector. Now, Phil Spector's now serving time in prison for murder, but at the time, he was, a, <laughs> he was the biggest star in producing in Hollywood. And so they hooked up with a couple of writers, and You've Lost That Loving Feeling became 16 weeks on the billboard, number one. Now, this is the truth. From the 20s to the end of the 20th century, their song, You've Lost That Loving Feeling, Number one played song in radio history. Now, that's not 2001 because the 21st century, but in the 20th century, the number one played song in radio history. And I lived with him in the 70s and 80s. We both got divorced at the same time. I moved in with him. My rent was $50 a week, and we lived on Millionaire's Row in Newport Beach. And he was playing Vegas, and I'll never forget this one story you'll like. He was friends with Elvis and spent time in Tennessee with Elvis and, and of course he opened for Frank Sinatra when Frank Sinatra was with the Sands and he 
uh, played with Kenny Rogers, and Rogers played with him, and Sonny and Cher were in his band, and Leon Russell, and on and on and on and on. Well, I'm with him for a week because I'm a high school teacher, but I have the summer off. So we go to Vegas in the casino. I'm staying there for a month, and I'm playing blackjack at the casino table, and he calls me up, and he said, Ronnie, uh, I've got front seats for Elvis. Elvis was in the main showroom at the Hilton Hotel. It called the International. It was the Hilton. And Bill was playing the 600-seater, the lounge, but it was 600-seater, brand new. And he had Darren, his son, and I said, I'll go ahead. And so naturally, they sit in the front seat, and sure enough, go backstage, talk to Elvis the whole bit. Well, I'm playing blackjack and probably losing, so I missed the opportunity. And sure enough, Elvis passed away a few years past that. So I had my opportunity to say, I met Elvis Presley, but Bill was a good friend of his. And uh, he opened for Jack Benny, some of you older people. Jack Benny was kind of the contemporary of Bob Hope. And uh, he was in Vegas. And so Bill Medley, a part of the Righteous Brothers, has a long history, but he's a Santa Ana High product. And if you read his book, which is called The Righteous Brothers Memoir, The Time of My Life, and you're in love with Santa Ana, the first few chapters are about the Orange County beginnings and a lot about Santa Ana and Barnes and Noble has it. Now, if you want to get a signature like I have, the best thing to do when you want to sell this on Pawn Stars, don't get your name on there. Just leave the date and the signature. So you got, I was wearing this. A friend of mine had a jacket because we grew up in Santa Ana together, and he's playing in Vegas, and they offered him, I think, $1,000 to get this, this shirt because the Righteous Brothers played all the big casinos in Vegas for a long time. So let's come out and support it. November 20th, 7.30, Santa Ana High School. No, no, hold it. Not November 20th, February 20th. Thank you. And uh, if, you, uh, if you'd like uh, ticket information, write this number down, 714-541-7082. Operators are standing by. And you can call that number and you can get information about tickets for the concert. February 20th at Santa Ana High School, the benefit dollars for scholars. If you enjoyed hearing a little bit of Ron's stories about it, you're going to love being at the concert, and it's a way to get in touch with a, a great part of Santa Ana, California, national, and actually worldwide music history, and so I know you're going to enjoy it. So we'll leave some of the flyers out here, and we look forward to seeing you all on February 20th. Thank you. Now I'm going to turn things over to Mayor Pro Tem Vince Sarmiento. And boy, I told you we were going to get some history. That was a lot of interesting history. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You know, I, I uh, forgot all about the muffler shop. So, you know, thanks to Rob and Ron, they were able to remind us uh, how it all began. So that's, uh, that's a nice uh, memory here. Um, if I could have the family of uh, Doña Catalina Muñoz, la familia de Doña Catalina Muñoz, y los amigos, todos del uh, vecindario Delhi, si me pueden acompañar aquí arriba. Um, I have the, um, you know, the bittersweet honor of doing a posthumous um, reclamation, proclamation for uh, Miss Muñoz, who uh, passed away um, just uh, a couple of weeks ago. and. Uh, these are always very difficult because uh, Mrs. Munoz was somebody who um, we cared about deeply, and I uh, knew her personally. She was a leader. She was somebody who I admired uh, uh, very, very much. She um, was somebody who advocated and was, uh, was just a very strong um, uh, uh, advocate for folks in her neighborhood, which was the Delhi neighborhood. And you have here... Uh, Mrs. Munoz's family and friends and neighborhood leaders from Delhi. This uh, recognition was supposed to take place when uh, Miss Munoz was still alive. And we wanted to bring her down here and recognize her for all the great work that she did over the years. Unfortunately, um, she became um, uh, ill and we weren't able to, um, to recognize her uh, here at the city council. Uh, she passed away on us. Um, as I said just a couple of weeks ago, and I asked the family if we could come and do this because it, do this here publicly and do it posthumously because I think it's important for all of us to um, bear witness to a life that um, 
was much bigger than just a, a simple, ordinary life. It was somebody who dedicated her um, years, many years, to, again, being somebody who cared deeply for her community, loved this city, and uh, loved her neighbors and cared for everybody that was near her. So um, I want to thank um, her husband, Nicolás, uh, her son, Gabriel, her daughter, Otilia, and her son, Jorge, who's not here with us, and all the neighborhood leaders here from Delhi, um, Doña Rosa, and everybody else as well. Um, you know, uh, 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 Doña Catalina, and as we all called her, you know, um, with uh, kindness, Doña Cata was somebody who I remember uh, speaking with many, many times because, you know, I represent the ward where Delhi is, uh, is located, and she'd sit me down, and she never raised her voice. She never, ever became hostile. She never said anything that was offensive, but she always got her point across because she was firm, she was respectful, she was committed, and she was just tireless. So, uh, you know, all of us, I think, can learn from that example, and I think all of us do, because she led in a very quiet but firm way. So um, that sort of uh, dignity, that elegance that she had um, really resonated with me, and she made a profound impact on my life, and I'm just blessed to have known her, and I'm very fortunate to have known her, and we're all fortunate in the city to have had uh, somebody like her uh, leave such a profound legacy. Um, I'm going to see if you'll all indulge me, because many of um, her family members and residents from uh, Delhi and those who are watching us uh, are monolingual Spanish speakers, so I'm going to do a little bit of this recognition in Spanish, just so we can go ahead and uh, make sure that we include uh, the family to let them know that they're um, so well loved and cared for, and we, we, we love their mother and, um, and Doña Cata with uh, such, such, such kindness. So let me do this a little bit in Spanish, and I'm going to turn it over to somebody, and maybe uh, her godson, I see Leonel is here, and he may want to say a few words as well as one of the family members. Con mucho respeto, les invito aquí a su casa para celebrar la vida uh, de Doña Cata. Y um, para nosotros... Yo sé que es una pérdida muy personal a ustedes, la familia, pero también es una pérdida para todos nosotros que la conocimos, que vivimos aquí en la ciudad, que fuimos vecinos de ella y fuimos personas que admiraron, admiró todo lo que ella hizo en su vecindario y por la ciudad. Y les estaba diciendo que yo quería hacer este reconocimiento antes de que ella falleciera, lastimosamente el tiempo no nos alcanzó. Pero aquí estamos reunidos, una familia uh, más grande, la, la familia de la ciudad, uh, para decirle que uh, lo, lo sentimos mucho, pero al mismo tiempo celebramos todo lo que hizo ella en vida. Entonces, um, Doña Cata vino aquí a los Estados Unidos en el 1960 y se vino a Santana en 1973. Entonces pasó mucho tiempo aquí en nuestra ciudad. Trabajó mucho tiempo contribuyendo 18 años de su vida uh, abogando por todo lo que, uh, todo lo que logró ahí en el, en el vecindario de, de Delhi. Siempre estaba hablando de cómo era peligroso en su, en su vecindario cuando ella llegó y se, di, se dedicó a mejorarlo. No nomás era una persona que se quedó con los brazos cruzados y aceptó las cosas como eran. Ella salió a luchar. Ella salió a defender sus derechos, a defender a sus vecinos y todos que vivían alrededor de ella. Todo su, su, su sueño para el centro comunitario de, Del, de Delhi era para que los niños tengan donde um, poder jugar en un ambiente seguro, en un ambiente protegido y que ellos puedan seguir adelante con su educación y académicamente. Um, uh, ella siempre... Uh, también abogó por la gente anciana, tratándoles con respeto, con dignidad y sabiendo que para ellos la gente de la tercera edad son muy, muy importantes a nuestra sociedad y nuestro, nuestra comunidad. Uh, ayudó a mujeres que eran mujeres solas, que estaban criando a sus hijos y también ayudó a muchos de los, uh, uh, de los teenagers, ¿o no? En centros donde ellas, ellos puedan estar juntos y no estar en un ambiente de peligro. Entonces, ella implementó muchos proyectos alrededor de Delhi que tienen que ver con semáforos para hacer, para ver uh, más seguridad para los peatones. Insta uh, hizo que instalaran los brazos para proteger cuando están cruzando los trenes ahí cerca de Delhi. Y también uh, hizo que una compañía de fábrica 
que estaba uh, creando muchos tóx tóxicos que se moviera del vecindario. Todo eso hizo una persona, una persona con una voz bien tranquila, sin gritar a nadie, sin ofender a nadie, lo hizo porque habló con tanto, tanto, tanta dedicación y se comprometió a todos esos bienes. Uh, ella era una persona de una fe profunda, era una católica muy, muy entregada a su iglesia y ahí siempre le encontraba, si le querían encontrar, en la, en, um, en la iglesia de Guadalupe, ahí en, en el vecindario de Delhi. Ahí siempre estaba, ha sido muy, una persona muy querida que todos le esperaban y le encontraban ahí. Y su, y su mensaje de ella era cuando haya algún problema que lo comuniquen y también que estén unidos como un vecindario. Fue una gran líder y también se entregó 30 años de, uh, de su vida trabajando con OCO, que es el Orange County Congregation Community Organization. Uh, y recibió uh, un reconocimiento de ellos en el 2015 por un liderazgo y un legado de li liderazgo. Entonces, a uh, ella se, se le impactó tanto su tiempo con OCO que le invitó a su... A su uh, uh, a Leonel, que se entregue también él y también él sea parte de eso. Uh, y toda su, todo su familia también que se dediquen a, a ser gente que uh, sale adelante, protege su vecindario, se entregan a su, a su ciudad. Entonces, yo me siento muy orgulloso de estar aquí parado enfrente de ustedes, reconociendo una vida, una vida tan uh, importante y que dejó huellas tan profundas y tan grandes. I'm honored to be here uh, with you to celebrate the life of Doña Cata Muñoz, who left such a profound impact on all of us, um, left very, very large uh, footprints here, as we say, in her community and in the city. And I'm just very blessed to have known her and privileged to have been in her presence. And I'm so glad that we had the opportunity and the family gave us the permission to allow us as a city family to recognize her life and to celebrate with them what's a very difficult moment for them, which is their loss, but at the same time for them to know how important her life meant to all of us. So with that, let me turn it over to Leonel, who's uh, her godson, and I know he'd like to say a few words on behalf of the family and on behalf of uh, Doña Cata. Leonel. Pues ser el mensaje en español, pues yo este, estoy muy contento de de que le estén haciendo este reconocimiento a la familia a la familia Muñoz, especialmente que ellos están aquí, pero a mi madrina Catalina. Ah, quiero recordar unas palabras de ella. Ella decía, es podemos hablar fuerte sin necesidad de estar gritando. Podemos hablar fuerte sin necesidad de estar gritando. Era una gran líder, sigue siendo para mí, este, en mi corazón sigue estando. Este... Cuando ella llegó a la comunidad, era una de las comunidades más, uh, había mucha violencia, había mucha drogadicción, había muchas casas de prostitución. Y gracias al esfuerzo de ella, trabajando con la comunidad, en coordinación con la ciudad, se han logrado grandes cambios. Hoy, la comunidad es mejor, gracias a la participación de ella y nos dejó mucho trabajo. Nos dejó mucho trabajo por seguir, este, no, no podemos uh, dejar el trabajo empezado, entonces... Tenemos que seguir con el trabajo de mejorar nuestro, nuestro lindo vecindario del Jai, pero también nuestra linda ciudad de Santana. Muchas gracias y que Dios les bendiga. So, um, I have this proclamation that we're going to deliver posthumously to the family of Doña Cata Muñoz. And I have to tell the city manager that, you know, um, We had many talks with uh, Doña Cata before she passed, and, um, and one of the things was, um, you know, we got to work on the Dell High Center, and we're going to continue working on that, so I know that the uh, city manager is going to work with me and, and everybody in the neighborhood to make sure that we realize uh, good things for that center, because I think it has a legacy of many people who dedicated themselves, especially her. And I know that one of the things I think that would be special is that we maybe look at, um, as we work with them, how we maybe name one of the rooms, maybe name something there in her, in her uh, honor and in her memory. So um, let me um, have um, uh, Don Nico, si quiere pasar con nosotros, 
su familia aquí para recibir el reconocimiento. Um, so this is a proclamation from the city of Santa Ana to Doña Cata Muñoz for her tireless work over 18 years working in the Delhi community, dedicating her life to providing space for children, teens, single mothers, and seniors, and her constant message to the community, which was to communicate your concerns and stand together as a community, and for her 30 years of excellent service with uh, OCO. We're going to miss her deeply. We're going to miss, miss her sorely. But I think if those of us who remain and who knew her live our lives and emulate the examples that she left us, I think we'll be better people for that. So, muchas gracias por compartirle con nosotros, Don Nico. Sí, nuestros sentidos pésame, ¿eh? All right, uh, what I'm going to do is, I know that we have a lot of people that want to discuss item 25D, the ICE contract. So um, instead of making all those folks wait, what I'm going to do is um, take things out of order and go to that item, and then I'll come back and go through the regular consent calendar and other items that we have. So I'm going to direct our attention to item 25 uh, D as in David this is the amendment with US Immigration and Customs Enforcement ICE to provide housing for federal inmates and uh, first I'm going to just ask staff if there's any presentation or recommendation then we'll listen to speakers then I'll bring it back to council I'll call on the mr. city manager David Cavazos thank you mayor members of the city council uh, very very high level uh, this uh, Agreement has been long-standing. Uh, we have uh, worked with individuals about the uh, federal contracts, including uh, this one. We uh, are, as part of this recommendation, asking to operate a transgender uh, pilot program at the Santa Ana Jail. We would uh, not add any beds, so there's no increase in beds. What we would uh, ask is that we be uh, able to uh, take more uh, people to uh, fill the beds that are already vacant because we have the fixed cost. Uh, and then, um, Mr. Mayor and City Council, we would uh, be in a better position long term to uh, prepay our debt. I know the Council's goal is to do an option uh, other than this contract. Uh, and the annual debt service is about $3 million a year, uh, and that's uh, outstanding till 2024. Uh, we are working on a credit analysis to give us more options. And so um, that's the, the merit here. All of the other conditions would stay the same. Uh, we can cancel this contract on 90 days notice. Uh, we, we take great pride on how we operate the jail. I will tell you, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, that in the past, uh, when there's been this much concern about an item, uh, we've always uh, encouraged meetings with the individuals, talking to them. So if the council desires and directs me, uh, we could meet with the community, talk to them about the contract. Because at the end of the day, I know that um, this contract is not desirable by both the majority of people who live here and the council, but we're not quite there yet in terms of looking at an option. So we offer that as a suggestion, too, on the staff level. Yeah, yeah, we should do that. Thank you. So are there questions uh, before we hear from speakers? Go ahead, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would recommend that we pull the matter, but, um, you know, pursuant to the, um, the comments made by the city manager, but I'd like to see if there are any, but if there are any people in the public who want to comment, um, advise us if they can condense the comments just to let us know what direction they are. But I would say as well, um, I would direct the city manager and his staff to meet with um, folks as well in the interim to see, um, you know, to any questions that need to be addressed. So um, why don't Ready we motion? go ahead and move in that direction? I'll second. Well, that's the direction we're we're going. So with that, uh, Ario Cortez. Followed by Jessica Lentona, please. Uh, 
good evening, Council. My name is Jairo Cortez. I'm the program coordinator for the Orange County Immigrant Youth United. Uh, I'm here to speak about the expansion of the scope of the uh, contract that the city jail has with ICE. Uh, we think it's extremely shameful um, that the city is looking to, you know, to, in a, in a sense, uh, cover its budget holes on the backs of undocumented people. Um, and so I, you know, I extremely urge all of you to vote no on this, on this proposal. Um, and, at this, and so I would ask also, I completely concur that we need more time, that you all need to meet with people who are directly affected by this contract. You're going to hear from a, from a wide variety of community members, from women who have been detained at this facility, which is not a model facility. Um, right now, I would like to submit a letter uh, signed by various community organizations. There are still more uh, who sent in their, uh, their signature a little late, so we will send an, an updated list. Um, so I'm going to turn this in. And I, th and I would just like to uh, close by, you know, just um, e expressing, you know, how disappointing it is that we're even having this conversation. We're talking about an all Latino, all Democratic city council, um, uh, you know, basically uh, taking a position that would make Donald Trump, uh, you know, about to, to vote on a, on a proposal that would make Donald Trump proud. Um, so once again, I urge you to vote no on this proposal. We do not need detention. We need dignity and we need uh, freedom for, for our undocumented immigrants in detention. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica, followed by Christina Fialo, please. Jessica, next. Christina, and after Christina, another Jessica Wingold after that. Good evening. My name is Janice Gutierrez, and I'll be translating for Jessica. Hola, muy buenas noches. Soy Jessica Letona. Hello, good evening. My name is Janice, Jessica Letona. Uh, soy um, de Guatemala y vengo a hablar un poco de la, de la experiencia que tuve en el centro de detención de Santa Ana por siete meses. I am from Guatemala and I am here to speak on the experience I had at the detention center here in Santa Ana for seven months. Uh, antes que nada quiero decir de que mi comunidad, la comunidad LGBT está sufriendo dentro de la detención de Santa Ana. Beforehand, I just want to say that the, my community, the LGBT community, is suffering inside the detention centers. Ya que no tienen un protocolo específico para atender a la comunidad transgénero. Because there is no a specific protocol in place to attend the necessities of transgender women specifically. Nos estamos muriendo de salud. No hay una salud integral para nuestra comunidad. We are dying in our health. There is not an integral, integral health in our community. Y algo muy importante todavía está el estigma y, y la discriminación. And something very important, there is uh, a stigma and discrimination. De parte de los oficiales hacia nosotras. In part of the ICE official against us. Es por eso que esta noche me dirijo a ustedes. That's why tonight I'm here speaking directly to you. Para que tomen el asunto muy, pero muy fuerte en que nuestra comunidad no está muy bien atendida dentro. So you all can strongly consider this issue and that our community is not safe inside these detention centers. Lo que queremos es que ya no nos agarren y que nos metan en estos lugares tan feos, horrorosos. What we want is for our trans community not to be detained and put into these horrific places. En donde el desayuno, almuerzo y cena solo es un plato de pasta, una manzana, un banano que no sirve. Where breakfast, lunch, and dinner, it's nothing but a piece of pasta and very unhealthy. En donde cuando queremos ver a un médico, 11, 12, 1 de la mañana, los oficiales no nos atienden. And also when we request to see a physician uh, around 1 or 12 or 1 in the morning, officials wouldn't listen to us. Y es por eso que vengo aquí a alzar mi voz. And that's why I am here today to raise my voice. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much. Gracias.
Christina Fowler, Jessica Wingold, Good evening, Mayor Polito and council members. Thank you for bringing this agenda item to the front. My name is Christina Fialo, and I live in Costa Mesa near Santa Ana. I'm an attorney and also the co-executive director of Civic, which is a nonprofit that visits and monitors immigration detention facilities nationwide. By now, you should have all received a copy of a multi-individual complaint that we filed on behalf of 31 women at the Santa Ana City Jail who are in ICE's custody but have been subjected to degrading and unlawful strip searches uh, in your jail. I'm here tonight to urge the council not to sign this contract modification with ICE and to end all unlawful strip searches of women and men in your jail. ICE is not a trustworthy partner. By partnering with ICE, the Council is sending a clear message to the people of Santa Ana that its police force is responsible first and foremost to ICE, not the community. This message is heard loud and clear by the people of Santa Ana, particularly the immigrant community, who are afraid to report crime and call for help because they fear ICE. This is not the type of community I want to live in, and I know Mayor Polito I suspect that this is not the legacy that you want to leave as the first Latino mayor of Santa Ana. We urge the council not to increase the fear in this community by increasing immigration detention bed space and deepening this very misguided relationship with ICE. Whether or not the council signs this contract modification though, the Santa Ana City Jail's policy and practice of strip searches must comply with all relevant laws and practices. I want to tell you about Gloria Hernandez who's in your custody right now at the Santa Ana City Jail. She came to the United States after suffering a horrific gang rape in her home country of Honduras. Now Ms. Hernandez is forced to relive her past sexual trauma during the unnecessary strip searches in your jail. Your jail has a responsibility to answer two questions when doing strip searches. First, under California Penal Code 4030 and ICE's performance-based national detention standards, which you signed on to in the most recent contract, you're, and you're obligated to follow, the jail must first ask whether it has reasonable suspicion to strip search a person, whether they have reasonable suspicion that they're concealing weapons or contraband. If it doesn't have reasonable suspicion, then of course you can't strip search the individual. If there is reasonable suspicion, then the next question is who can perform the strip search? The Prison Rape Elimination Act adopted by DHS requires, and I quote, all strip searches must be performed by staff of, staff of the same gender as the detainee. In every instance that we have documented at the Santa Ana City Jail, women who by definition are female in gender have been strip searched by men. The Santa Ana City Jail's practice of having men strip search, strip search transgender women conflates gender identity and sex and could lead to the jail losing its its accreditation. Moreover, these strip searches may violate the Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, and some strip searches may even violate the Eighth Amendment as cruel and unusual as cruel and unusual. If you can please uh, conclude, the lights red. Yes, um, we basically urge the council to vote no and end this immigration contract and end immigration detention in Santa Ana. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is uh, Laura Cantor here? Laura Cantor. Jorge Gutierrez, after Laura, Jorge, Jorge, if you could come down after that, Carlos uh, Perrea, please go ahead. Hi, good evening. Um, thank you, Mayor Polito, um, City Council members. Um, I've had an interesting week because it started with a meeting with one of your interns coming to speak with me about flying the rainbow pride flag here in Santa Ana from May 22nd till the end of June. Um, as an, uh, um, an example of this kind of city that we are in and the inclusion and um, care that we want to demonstrate, not just for our LGBT people, but for all people, including um, our Im immigrant population. Um, so I am here to speak um, about our concerns from the LGBT Center, Orange County, um, about the transgender women detainees. Um, over the last eight months, we have seen a steady rise in um, requests for help from women who are being released from the jail in Santa Ana. Um, detainees, transgender women detainees who are coming out of the jail, ICE lets them out at random times, no plans, no resources, nothing but what they came with. 
no money, no phones, no contacts, nowhere to go. Um, a woman got to us after spending a night on the streets in downtown Santa Ana. We were able to give her a bus pass and start getting her on her way, but this is happening more and more. So as you consider increasing um, the number of transgender women and gay men who are coming to the jail as detainees, we um, also need to consider the post-detention resources that don't exist. Um, and that is also a part of our city and something we need to think about. Um, I think there's also some fundamental issues um, that we really need to look at uh, around uh, people's understanding of what it means to be transgender. Um, and, um, you know, while uh, the jail administrator, by the way, if uh, talking about having multiple um, advocate, advocacy discussions with advocates, the jail administrator is the only person who came to me to reach out to me multiple times and trying to um, develop more awareness and figure out what to do regarding the situation. Um, but despite the recommendations that we made, um, ICE has not put those recommendations into the contract. Um, and um, I do not think that they're a trustworthy partner, and I don't think that they're on the side of the people. Um, we know that they're not. Um, our recommendations to ICE have included the need for robust, comprehensive training for all jail staff so that they can do their jobs and keep people safe. We've requested a mechanism for community oversight as a way to ensure care competency and community participation on this transgender classification care committee. We recommended developing a medi medical protocol for hormone treatment to ensure proper hormone levels are reached and maintained. And we are suggesting a protocol for when detainees are released by ICE. It seems like a pretty insurmountable task and an unworkable situation, if you ask me. Um, instead, we've had a number of requests um, from ICE um, uh, and service providers that have been indiscriminate and loose um, pro, uh, requests for pro bono services that will, no way, that will in no way meet the needs of the jail. Last week, we received an email from someone at ICE asking if we would be able to provide pro bono classes for the trans women detainees. This request was sent to multiple people at the LGBT Center you OC. could please conclude. Your light is red. Um, and also at the, Los, at the center in Los Angeles. Um, this, in the same week, we received a request from a contracted mental health services provider. This, to me, is the most alarming, and I'll finish with this, for a pro bono crash course in diagnosing gender dysphoria. For those of you who do not know what gender dysphoria is, it's the DSM-5 diagnosis that allows transgender people to access medical care and treatment. Thank you. And they deserve more than a crash course. Jorge Gutierrez, followed by Carlos Ferreira, followed by Isan Oyola. Hi, my name is Jorge Gutierrez. I'm with Familia Trans Queer Liberation Movement. We're a queer and trans Latino organization. And we've been working really closely with immigrant communities, LGBT communities, um, and trans folks here in Santana. And I'm here to uplift um, the case of Cristina um, Lopez, uh, who is a 35-year-old trans woman from Peru who has been detained in your city jail for almost two years now, who has, has been diagnosed with hepatitis C inside detention center and up to this day has had no medical treatment for her condition. And so for us, it's unacceptable, it is shameful, it is outrageous that this city would consider increasing your budget on the suffering and pain and torture of trans women inside detention centers. So we will continue to organize with the local community, with immigrant uh, communities, with LGBT or uh, communities and organizations here to hold all of you accountable to ensure that you stand with the Latino community. Because right now, as we see it, you all are standing with ICE, are standing with DHS, and not with our people. Carlos, followed by Isa, and then uh, Richard Weeder. Richard Weeder. Hello, my name is Carlos Perea, and we raise. We're an organization that advocates for the rights of the American community. Now, the issue of the ICE contract, specifically to the Yale, is nothing new. We've been talking about this for over a year. Now, last year, when the community mobilized and came to ask you to cancel the contract, you said, give us time. Give us time to figure out how we're going to get out of this mess that we have with ICE. Now, you directed your city staff to find a solution. Now this is your city staff is presenting you with us something that contradicts what you already had said before, your commitment to the community. He's saying, the city manager, hey, let's solve this problem because we're subsidized to the city, we're not making money, we need to sustain it. So why don't we increase uh, from $80 to $105 uh, what we charge to ICE per person? Why don't we increase the capacity of how many people we house? Now, I don't have to tell you this, but a vote 
to expand this contract does not represent the values of the community that you represent. And it definitely increases the fear and the mistrust the community has towards you, specifically at times when we need leaders, when we need champions to fight the anti-immigrant rhetoric. So I expect a vote or not, and I expect you to engage with your community and the transgender women that have been affected. Thank you. Thank you. Isaiah, followed by Richard Weeder. Hi, I'm Isa Noyola. I am one of the directors at the Transgender Law Center, the largest uh, legal organization in the country. Um, I am here to deliver a message from our transgender and gender nonconforming communities who are both inside detention and outside detention. The message is quite simple. It's no to the expansion and no to the increasing of the budget and reach of ICE that is wreaking havoc in all of our communities. No to the torturing of human life that is experienced every day inside detention centers. What is happening inside Santa Ana is indicative of what is happening across this country and in many, many detention centers. ICE likes to boldly claim that it is an ally to the LGBT community and say that it is addressing the transphobic violence. ICE would like to make you believe that it is on the right side of justice and the right side of law. All of this is false. All of this is rhetoric that is delusional, misguided, and rooted in xenophobic, transphobic hate. ICE has the prosecu prosecutorial discretion to release our community, but refuses to do so. The cities, counties, and towns that decide to collude with ICE and expand and uphold the need for detention centers will be met with community resistance human rights violation complaints, and lawsuits. Santa Ana is facing a huge liability if it indeed decides to strengthen its relationship to ICE. An organized community is a powerful and mighty community. And we ask this council to stand on the right side of justice. We ask that the city of Santa Ana stand with the, its most vulnerable population of trans communities and end detention for all of us. It is time. Thank you. Richard, followed by Destiny Caro. Hi, thank you, City Council. Um, mine's more of a personal story, um, as my wife um, was detained at the Santa Ana City Jail. Um, my name is Richard Wheeler. I arrested my family um, at home in September 2014 during a warrantless non-consensual entry for civil immigration violation, nothing else. What followed was ICE denying my mother-in-law, Petra Albrecht, to attend her own dependency court hearings, which is a due process violation. <coughs> And then ICE illegally took her 11-year-old son, my brother-in-law, Jason Albrecht, out of the U.S., placed him in a German youth uh, orphanage before his approved asylum claim could be adjudicated, basically breaking the United Nations protocol, international laws and treaties. Uh, we do not know his whereabouts, health, or safety since December 17, 2014. This is ICE. My mother-in-law and wife served almost 17 months of hard, abusive, retaliatory time in separate detention centers. My wife, Nicole Albrecht, did the last 13 months in Santa Ana City Jail. What happened to my wife at the direction of ICE and carried out by the Santa Ana City Jail staff was deplorable, including documented malnutrition, medical neglect, abuse, retaliation, illegal strip searches, as she's part of the uh, civil rights um, complaint, and the prevention of her attorney due process rights on numerous occasions, which is against her constitutional rights, even as an illegal immigrant. 
constant actions such as these make one thing clear. ICE cannot be trusted. I have seen it with my own eyes for 17 months in Santa Ana and Adelanto and Ote and all of these detention centers. And that's why the city of Santa Ana needs to end its contract with ICE and rein in the city officials who illegally strip search my wife and other detainees at the facility. And just so you know, after my wife raised her voice about the illegal strip search by filing this civil rights complaint, along with the 30 other um, fellow women in the immigration detention, ICE deported her. But I will not let them deport her story or silence her abuse. ICE cannot be trusted. I'm asking you, after seeing it with my own eyes and living it for 17 months of just deplorable actions from ICE and the Santa Ana City Jail to end its contract before it's too late. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wheeler. Destiny Cato. Destiny, the floor is yours, followed by Benjamin Vasquez. Hello, City Council. My name is Destiny. Uh, I'm a student at Cal State Fullerton, and I also work at the LGBT, LGBTQ Research Center at, on, on that campus. I'm a student advocate for transgender students at that school, and it's appalling to me to hear that you want to continue this contract with ICE. People are being abused, and it's absolutely not necessary. Your duty is to the community. You have the power to stop this abuse just by saying no. You have the power. It's unfortunate that us as people, we are here together, and I hope that you see us, that us being here together united, that you will understand that we need this. We need this to stop. Listen to us. We're, here, we're all here telling you to stop this. Stop your contract with ICE. Stop profiting off people in this community when your duty is this, to this community. Show this with real action. Show this by saying no. Thank you. Thank you, Destiny. Benjamin Vasquez, followed by Ashley Rojo. Welcome, Benjamin. Hello, I'm Benjamin Vasquez. I'm a volunteer at the Centro Cultural de Mexico. I'm a teacher at Valley High School. And uh, I'm, it's kind of shameful that we have to come and ask you to vote this down. That could be obvious that having a nice contract shouldn't be allowed. Uh, it's a time to phase it out instead of fix it up. It's really uh, not, I don't think this is what you guys came in for. None of you guys came in to lock up our community. You guys, you guys uh, should be representing us. The ICE contracts goes against community policing that we're supposed to be growing and, and, and the people are not trusting, my students do not trust the police. I have a lot of undocumented students with undocumented parents. As you walk through, and I've been doing work on towns, and the, the people don't trust the police. And we're supposed to be building this trust through community policing, which is some philosophy lost between the community and the police right now, but that's another story. Um, it's, it's a shame because you guys are, are, oh, you're not doing it, but I hope you don't choose the bottom line over the dignity of our community, of how we live, and bringing up another 100 beds into, into play. So I'm asking you guys, please don't, don't, don't do this. Don't add these 100 beds. And it's, it's really sad that we have to start, we have to start healing. And, and this is not going to do, this is, this is where it starts for us. Like, please listen to the people who are here and, and let's fix the problems that we do have so we can start growing and, and having solutions instead, instead of worrying about the bottom line. Thank you. Thank you, Benjamin. <laughs> Ashley Rojo followed by Robert Roberto Herrera. Hi, good evening. My name's Ashley. I'm also a student at Cal State Fullerton and also a victim advocate for sexual assault victim services here in Santa Ana. I am also here to express my disapproval of the ICE proposal and urge you to vote no. I feel it will only do harm to those who are often fleeing violence and injustice, who once coming to this country are faced with more injustices. It would only... Expanding the jail, it seems... I just don't understand what, what good it could do. I only see it causing harm and causing harm to the undocumented individuals who are already being held there and just especially to those who are LGBTQ and transgender. The city's money could be better used elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto Herrera, followed by Amanda Wallner and Reverend Kent Doss. 
Good evening, City Council. My name is Roberto Herrera, and I'm a member of De Colores Queer OC, and also a lifelong resident of Santana. De Colores is a community organization that seeks to educate and increase visibility for queer and trans Latinos here in Orange County. It has become apparent to us that the queer and trans immigrant communities in detention can be overlooked. I say this because within the last four months, our organization has collectively visited five trans women at the Santa Ana City Detention Center. They have shared with us their struggles, their needs, and wants. One main concern we hear about is the lack of health care available, and when it is available, how prolonged it takes to receive proper treatment. For instance, one trans woman we visited was living with diabetes, yet the detention facility knowingly re neglected to provide her food suited to maintain her health. Similarly, requests for hormone treatment were dragged out, and when treatment came, low dosages were uh, administered. Requests to receive new eyeglasses took more than three months. And as someone who uses eyeglasses daily, they become imperative to my day-to-day -day tasks like reading and writing. And considering the detainees, this amounts to being able to read and write your own brief and appeal. It is clear to the Colores that the ICE detention facility in Santana cannot take proper care of our community. It is therefore that we ask the Santa Ana City Council to not sign an extended contract with ICE. It is our intention that you liberate all queer and trans detainees at the Santa Ana City Jail. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Roberto. Amanda Walner, followed by Reverend Kent Doss and Peggy Thompson. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Amanda Walner. I'm the Policy and Operations Manager at the Los Angeles LGBT Center, uh, the world's largest provider of services for LGBT, the LGBT community. Um, I'm here today to express our deep concern with the expansion proposal that's before you. I think that you've heard the most compelling testimony already from the folks who have lived through it, uh, but I want to give you a service provider's perspective as well. Um, through the services that we provide, the center has seen detainees from the GBT mod at the Santa Ana City Jail in our emergency homeless shelter, our health clinic, and our legal services department. Many of these women seek out services at the center because basic services are not being met at the jail. We do not believe that ICE is doing its part to ensure that asylum seekers and all immigrants detained at the jail are treated with dignity and respect and are given the resources they need to thrive upon being released back into their communities. Uh, community groups like the center and others represented here should not be relied upon to provide a patchwork of services for LGBT detainees in Southern California. ICE is currently not meeting the basic needs of GBT detainees at the Santa Ana Jail, and the city should reject the proposed expansion, uh, and we do support the call of the other groups to uh, delay this decision. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Amanda. Reverend Kent Doss, followed by Peggy Thompson. Good evening. Uh, my name is Kent Doss. I'm the minister at the church that sponsors the Friends of Orange County Detainees. We visit detainees in three different facilities here in Orange County, including your jail. The decision that you're up against is quite a large decision. It has a whole lot of money involved and numerous and complex implications for the people held in that facility. And it's unwise to make any such decision without some sense of context. So I wanted to bring a little bit more context to this evening's conversation. First of all, a reminder that just a few years ago, before ICE contracted with the Santa Ana City to use this facility, transgender detainees were housed with the general population of immigrant detainees. It was an incredibly dangerous environment. It was an environment where they were raped repeatedly. They were held there until complaints were raised, enough complaints were raised to ICE for ICE to seek out a solution to segregate those detainees here in your facility. While the GBT detainees are a little bit safer here in segregated units, I still have deep personal concerns, particularly about the strip searches that are in pretty clear violation of legal policy, unless I'm grossly misunderstanding that. Another piece of context that I only learned today from a colleague in New York is that in June of 2015, ICE significantly re revised its standards for treatment of transgender detainees. The changes aren't perfect, but 
they're a significant improvement. They're an improvements that I would possibly like to see here in Santa Ana should you make the mistake of choosing to continue your relationship with ICE. Here's the hitch. Those improvements can't happen until a new policy is, or until a new contract is implemented or negotiated with the city. I had a lot more to say, but I'm going to wrap up by saying, frankly, I am terrified for the freight of gay, bisexual, and transgendered immigrants and detainees. I've met many of them. I've heard the horror stories of the countries that they come from. I've seen them thrown out of your jail here at night at 9 o'clock without a cent to their name, without a place to go. But with all of that said, I'm here to stand with your constituents, with the people of this community, immigrants, LGBT immigrants, who want you to not renew this contract because it is bad for the city, it's bad for your constituents, it's bad for all of us. Thank you, Reverend. <laughs> Peggy Thompson followed by Meet Sony. Uh, good evening and uh, thank you uh, for this opportunity. Um, my name is Peggy Thompson. I currently actually head the leadership team for Friends of Orange County Detainees. Um, we are um, an organization that started in uh, 2012 at uh, Tapestry uh, Unitarian Universalist Congregation in Mission Viejo uh, in uh, partnership with Un Irvine United Congregational Church. We offer regular visits to undocumented detainees in our local jails. And although we're not in a position to provide legal, medical, or social services, we do offer listening ears and compassionate hearts in an act of friendship and to affirm each person's human dignity and worth. I spend a large part of my time every week at the Santa Ana Jail um, visiting uh, uh, with uh, LGBT immigration detainees, including the transgender women. Uh, in addition, I have continued to provide support in various ways to many of these detainees after they are released. Um, as several people have stated, um, they're often released on a street, they are released actually always on a street corner less than a block from where we're all sitting right now. Uh, often uh, they have no money, no telephone, no friends or relatives in the area, and no place to go. Uh, they lack warm clothing, many don't speak English, and they're totally lost. They have no idea where they are. Uh, for transgender women in particular, the streets can be a very dangerous place and there are no available shelters that will accept them. I have felt compelled to take a number of these transgender women into my own home simply because they just had no place else to go. Uh, it's been an honor and a privilege for me to get to know these beautiful and courageous transgender women, most of whom have fled from an unimaginable neglect, discrimination, abuse, and mortal danger in their home countries in order to seek a safe haven here in the U.S. where they hope to win asylum and build a new life. I was truly horrified when I learned about the Santa Ana jail strip search policy. As a woman, I can't imagine any experience more degrading and humiliating than a strip search, particularly one performed by a male officer. <clears throat> For many of the transgender women who have suffered from horrific sexual abuse, it can be even more traumatic and devastating. I understand that there are occasions in the jail setting where a strip search may be necessary and appropriate. I do not believe that a visit with one's attorney or a trip to court should automatically constitute probable cause that a detainee is concealing contraband. I'm not an attorney but I have read the applicable sections of the California Penal Code and the ICE regulations covering strip searches. And in my opinion, they are clearly being misinterpreted and misused by the city of Santa Ana to justify its current policy. Unnecessary and indiscriminate strip searches are both illegal and inhumane, and I ask the city council to take action to end them immediately. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thompson. Meet Sony, followed by Luis Sarmiento. Is, is uh, Meet Sony here? If not, Luis, you're up. Followed by David Manjikayan and Maria Duque. Welcome, Tokayo. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Council and Pulido, Mayor Pulido, um, wherever he might be. 
Um, <clears throat> no, I, I just want to um, just uh, express a concern. Um, I, I hope that, uh, and, and also staff, um, everyone, basically, I, my concern is that I, I just hope that everyone is listening. Because um, once again, the community is mobilized to uh, come out to, um, to, to be heard. Um, I, we know that the, the issue with the ICE contract, as was mentioned before, is not new. Um, and um, unfortunately, uh, we've seen a lack of, of leadership, basically, um, on, 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 on behalf of council, on behalf of staff. And what the community is asking you to do is to do something different. Don't keep making the same mistakes. Don't keep managing uh, the city's resources in the same way. We really need to see something different. And so um, the invitation today is for all of you to, to take leadership in that way, to do something different. And if you <clears throat> would like to do so, all you have to do is listen and listen to your community and reach out to us, so reach out to the community and work with us because this, the, the community has all kinds of ideas on how things can be done differently. So that's the invitation that you all have today. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is um, David uh, Manjukian, followed by Maria Duge. Uh, hello, Council. Uh, I'm here on behalf of uh, UC Irvine Law School uh, Immigration Rights Clinic. Uh, many of our clients are facing deportation and are currently being housed at Santa Ana Jail. I'm here to share with the council members some of the medical issues our clients have been facing as well as other detainees. And uh, ICE's inability to treat those medical issues properly or at all. Uh, one detainee, which we have actually already discussed, has hep hepatitis C due to being raped in another facility. Despite a doctor ordering treatment on two separate occasions, she has been detained for almost two years without any sort of treatment whatsoever. Another detainee had terrible tooth pain. She spent several days writhing in pain until she was able to see a dentist. The dentist used some type of topical agent uh, in the detainee's mouth and sent her away. This treatment had no effect and the detainee continued to feel excruciating pain uh, for several days. She was unable to sleep, unable to eat most foods. She submitted uh, several medical complaints per day for one week to no avail. Eventually, and only when an officer told the medical staff that her complaints were serious, uh, was she able to see the dentist again and have her tooth pulled. Finally, one detainee who has been detained for almost one year has needed new glasses for approximately nine months. Uh, she has filled out several medical requests per week and has asked ad nauseum for several months to get new glasses. As of last week, when I last spoke with her, she has not received new glasses. Her current glasses, which are broken and far too weak, cause her constant headaches uh, and nausea. Every single detainee I've spoken with, and there's many more than I mentioned today, uh, has complained about some egregious medical mistreatment. Um, the city has to send a strong message to the community that this type of medical negligence and malpractice cannot stand. A detention facility is not a jail. Uh, these individuals are not inmates, yet they are often treated worse than the most violent criminals. It is clear that ICE cannot provide for the basic necessities of the current population of Santa Ana Jail. I therefore urge the City Council to not expand the detention center and to consider ending its contract with ICE. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Maria, followed by Marilyn uh, Montano. And then after that, uh, Alexis Nava Teodoro. Good evening, Council. My name is Maria Duque, uh, organizer with USWW here in Orange County. I'm going to be really short and concise and to the point, right? I represent and we represent USWW 7,000 members here in Orange County. And we just ask that you reject unjust policies that don't support our members, their families, and our community members. We look up to you. Our membership, look, membership looks up to you to make just decisions that support our community. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Marilyn, followed by Alexis, followed by Carmen. Um, good evening. My name is Marilyn Montano, and I'm here because I'm also opposed to the ICE expansion in Santana. And I agree with a lot of the community members that have spoken on this item, and I wanted to share a poem. 
Um, it's called his Machuca the Hands. Um, it's 6 a.m. and the gray streets that dingle in his eyes as, as he drives in his white Toyota pickup truck through the white fog. The pondering cold weather like the anti-immigrant laws that drown this country. And yes, it's possible to live in a world without borders. So un cabecito and donut that, that only seem to ease of this madre. The sweeping men dressed in yellow that, own, that read caution, but never really stopping to caution about their own health. See, day and night, the bones click and clack, like the, like the baby rattles <laughs> in my little brother's hand. See, they take away the pain at the end of the day. My father must drink away his 40 so he doesn't feel 40 anymore. And I don't blame him for being alcoholic at times. I blame the exploitation. I blame the emotional and physical borders. I blame the corruption and greed that haven't done no deed. See, too much back pain in Machuca the hands. He don't believe in Western medicine, only the natural remedies his mama gave him once he crossed over. And standing for more than two hours on wait at Home Depot. After hustled in more than five hours of underpaid work. Yes, he's trying to provide and survive, not divide like the, like the men that play poli nigra. But see, what kind of living is that? See, our father's just trying to make enough, yet he can't even still call it a living. See, has, his hands have been exploited enough. They aren't even recognizable to his own eyes anymore. They become rough, deep with cuts, like the nopales rooted on la tierra. See, he has come to accepting that's the way it must go, but that's fucked up because no one deserves that kind of treatment. See, not our father. Sometimes he just wish he can join the rallies and protests, but he can't put the fist up in the air anymore because his hands have been in the fist for too long since the day he crossed over La Frontera. So why are we so consumed? But somehow we all must seem to forget that he needs living too. The living to see his mother and, and homeland. The living to see his daughter and son graduate. The living to love his wife. The living to just be. To really get that American dream. What is the American dream? There are too many perspectives. There are too many borders trying to divide this American dream. So why is our family just not the right fit? Why must you cringe at the, fight of, at the sight of seeing my father's hand? Why must you put him down? See, my dog got more fussy than the one that you trained in the academy. See it? As I sit writing away, looking at my hand, he has sacrificed so much so I don't get his machucada hands. It is our families becoming written in the veins that circulates in his machucada hands. Passed so softly at the tips of my hands the day he holded me for the first time out of my mother's womb. Thank you. Thank you. Alexi. Followed by Carmen, followed by Reverend uh, Sian uh, Whitshave. <clears throat> Thank you, Council. Uh, by the way, uh, the next name, you don't need to call it because my mother couldn't make it. But her name is Carmen. Got it. So, so I'll, I'll go over it. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, so my name is Alexis. As some of you know, um, I'm the Deportation Defense Coordinator for RAIS. Um, I'm also staff organizer with the National Day Labor Organizing Network. And I know it's not a surprise, the agenda item that's put forward tonight. So I want to speak to those council members who have answered my calls before when there's people in deportation proceedings in Orange County. Those of you who have even helped us return somebody from a bus that was heading to TJ for deportation. Those are the folks that I want to address tonight. On behalf of RAIS and the National Day Labor Organizing Network, we stand in full support of the demands put forward by Jairo Cortez and everybody who signed on to that letter. Additionally, we stand in full support of the demands put forward by Familia and their national work with ICE in protecting their community. Additionally, we also uh, stand in full support of the cancellation of the ICE contract and uh, and we also demand that the city make a statement against the priority enforcement program. The last thing that I'm going to say is that um, there's other council members here who when, we've, when I've personally emailed you or contacted your secretaries to talk about people in deportation proceedings in your district, you've never once responded. I want to ask one question to Vincent Sarmiento because I'm in your district and so is my undocumented mother and my undocumented father. Will you finally answer my call when she gets detained and we're trying to stop her deportation? Will you listen to the LGBTQ community and their trans community who gets criminalized? The last thing I'm gonna say is that this is not about immigration because you've supported DAPA, you supported DACA when others didn't want to. 
This is not about immigration. This is about two things. And everybody that lives in this community knows these two things. It's about money, and it's about criminalization. Because you also support gang injunctions. You support the Santa Ana police officers who have killed innocent Latinos, who traumatized Edgar Vargas, who was detained by ICE, and now you have a federal investigation on your department. You know, don't forget about Edgar Vargas and what you all, your department did to him, you know? Stand on the right side of justice, support the demands of the LGBTQ trans community, and please end the contract now. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend. Reverend, followed by Edna Monroy. And after Edna, David Carvajal. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I am the Reverend Sean Wilshire, and I'm here representing CLU, which is the uh, Clergy and Laity United for Economic Justice. And I'm very grateful that you're taking the time to listen to this community. As you've heard pretty much overwhelmingly that they are against this contract, and I, I want to lend the voice of Clue as well to these voices that are here. You know, we all know that there is a broken immigration system going on. We can all sort of agree on that one point. And the problem with this contract is that it continues that broken system. It condones that broken system. We need a new way of doing things, not the same old business as usual. I'm willing to bet that there are dozens of people here that are willing to work with you to try to find some different solutions. And you're listening to the community this evening is the beginning of that, and I'm grateful. When I heard our city manager here talking about how much revenue was coming in, that it would bring in $3 million to the city, the first thought that ran through my head was, is that the price of dignity and worth? I ask you to consider please, to say no to this. It isn't the right choice. Listen to your community. They're crying out for your help, and you are people of great power who can help them. Thank you. Thank you, Edna. Followed by David Carvajal, and then Jose Hernandez, please. Hi, um, I'm Edna Monroy with CJA, California Immigrant Youth Justice Alliance, and I'm here as a concerned community member uh, to urge you all to vote no on any ICE expansions. Uh, we've seen so many injustices, so many human rights violations across the country, especially here in California and in Southern California. Uh, anywhere from, you know, continuous growing criminalization of our black and brown community to rates to growing ICE and police collaborations, to the implementation of PEP, and as we are seeing right now, to more expansions uh, in jails, right, in cages, uh, the La Capa community, right, where they're seen as less than animals, right, uh, their um, humanity is thrown out the window. Uh, we already heard testimonies from community that was detained there, uh, but we still have to hear from all the other voices that are forgotten, right, uh, that are deported, um, that passed away, right? Uh, and so I demand for you all to really listen to those communities, this community that you say you represent, um, that you are fighting for, to really take a stance against these abuses, against this um, profiting of our pain, uh, profiting of our human uh, lives. And so not one more deportation, not one more expansion, and, and trans detention. Thank you. Thank you, David, followed by Jose, followed by Ana Urusua. Hi, my name is David Carvajal, and I've, I've worked uh, in community-based health care for over three years now. Um, every day. David, bring the mic down just a tad, please. Thank you. I work in community-based healthcare for about three years now, and every day I see firsthand um, the violence that ICE raids and law enforcement in Santana perpetuate to our community. Um, I've seen um, women crying because they do not have access to healthcare. Um, the, it's, it's shameful that at a city council meeting led by all Latino members, we're discussing expanding such a violent contract. Um, if it's in the best interest of the city, um, that the community is safe and that the community feels safe. 
um, we demand um, all the that all the community feels safe, including our LGBTQ and our gender nonconforming brothers and sisters. Uh, we demand today that you stand on the right side of history. And if the people, again, if the people of Santana are a priority to you guys, you guys vote no on this expansion. Thank you, Jose. Followed by Anna, followed by Karina Arasoa. Uh, good evening, Mayor, City Council members. Um, I'm Jose, a resident of Santana here, a volunteer at the Centro Cultural de Mexico, member of the Orange County May Day Coalition. And, you know, this is an issue that we've, that we've been talking about for several years now. And, I mean, first of all, I just want to say um, I've been to a lot of city council meetings around uh, the county and, you know, congratulations on being the most unwelcoming city council meeting of, of all of them. You know, we have to get wanded, we have to get searched, we have to get patted down, and I'm just so tired of it. Like, you know, it doesn't make me feel welcome. You know, why, does, why is the city of Santana choosing to do this? You know, it, it, it just, we need to show leadership. But it just shows the criminalization that happens in our community. That's majority Hispanic, Latino in this, in this, in this city of Santana and, and the issue that we're dealing with. You know, this is a moment in time in, in our history where we're starting to see the, the rise of the civil rights movement, whether it's the LGBT or the Latino, the migrant rights, you know, to be able to, to change the narrative in the way that we've started to look, you know, look at our communities. You know, we've been criminalized, marginalized for so long. And, and Santana could really take a leadership in, in, the, in this fight where, you know, nationally, you know, we're, start, we're seeing the scapegoating of Mexicans, of migrants, as, you know, as poor people, as the problems, when instead of looking at, at Wall Street and the one percent and the bankers and the real people you know that didn't go to jail meanwhile a person that crosses the border simply for a better way of life is a criminal and there's something fundamentally wrong in our society when that's the status quo I've been to, to the jail I've talked to you know to a one inmate uh, there that that was a migrant and he doesn't know when he's gonna get out and his the, the system's all messed up his case gets pushed case gets pushed back and he doesn't know when he's gonna be free he has to raise money his there's no family around like these people are hopeless and uh, without hope and and I just commend all the folks that that are that are doing the work like the friends of detainees that that go and help these people when they are left in the middle of the night with nothing to you know to, you know to their name and nowhere to go to so I just really hope that we can finally stop the ice contract here in Santana the way that we've been asking and demanding for several years and we're in solidarity with all the folks that have come here and, and speak and to stop the ice contract it's time to stop the human trafficking it's it's time for human rights here in Santana. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Followed by Karina. Followed by Stacy Araujo. Good evening, Mayor, City Council members, and City staff. Uh, we've been before you on a number of occasions working with you on items such as transparency, participation, and accountability. Uh, and other times perhaps pushing you bef uh, beyond your comfort level. But it's pretty disappointing to see that you even consider this uh, conversation tonight and on the expansion of such a terrorizing institution. You have heard many accounts tonight on how the, this ex expansion would represent the further criminalization, detention, and deportation of beloved members of our families and our communities. You're, you have taken several steps in, in the right direction over the years. Your support of President Obama's Deferred Action Program, your resolution in support of immigrant families, and your honoring of Doña Catalina tonight are good ways for you to speak on your values. But voting no on this expansion tonight is a way to act on them. I think you've heard more than enough tonight. You have the power to end this conversation tonight. The leadership, the leadership we need from you next and soon is divestment and an end to collaborations with ICE. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Karina, followed by Stacy, And then after that, Angie Cano. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, uh, city council members, city staff. Uh, my name is Karina Paredes, and I'm here on behalf of CLU, Clergy and Lady United for Economic Justice. And I'm here to say, on behalf of a faith-based nonprofit organization, uh, that religious people of all faiths believe in the inherent worth um, 
and dignity of all people, uh, regardless of their natural origin. And law enforcement should not make life particularly treacherous for immigrants. And that is why CLU has continuously encouraged law uh, local government to end its collaboration with the Department of Homeland Security. And we urge the city of Santa Ana to become a city uh, that values and welcome immigrants. And that includes as a key part to not negotiate with ICE. These kinds of contracts that expand the, jail the jailing of immigrants is an ongoing tragedy to justice. And I have a letter on behalf of Clue to submit um, to urge you to oppose the expansion of the city's uh, contract with ICE. And I also want to add, as a proud daughter of undocumented immigrants, that immigrants are a blessing and not a burden. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Stacy, followed by Angie. Followed by Cecilia Iglesias. I'm going to translate. Go ahead. Buenas noches. Mi nombre es Stacy Araujo. Good night. My name is Stacy Araujo. Esta noche estoy aquí para expresar mi descontento y mi negación respecto a la idea de hacer expandir más espacio dentro de Santa Ana City Jail. Uh, this night I'm here to express my objection to the expansion of Santa Ana City Jail. Basada en mi experiencia de cuatro meses detenida dentro de esta, de esta cárcel. Based on my experience of being detained there for four months. Ya que dentro de esta cárcel solamente recibimos un trato inhumano. We only receive inhumane treatment being detained in this facility. Trato en el cual nuestra dignidad como personas, como mujeres trans, queda por los suelos. Where our dignity as trans women uh, falls to the floors in this kinds of facilities. En lo cual se nos coarta nuestros derechos humanos, como el derecho a la salud, a la alimentación. Where our human rights are being denied, our right to health, our right to nutrition, our right to food en donde se nos niega incluso la pastilla para un dolor de cabeza e incluso se nos niega nuestro tratamiento hormonal. Where we're even being denied a medicine for a headache, where we're even being denied other medicine that we need. En donde nos hacen pasar momentos de realmente de indignación en el cual muchas de nuestras compañeras lloran por el trato que se nos da. Where many of our, many of us even cry for the treatment that we receive where our dignity is not being respected. Ya que nos hacen abrir nuestro ano ante ellos para cada vez que nos revisan cuando vamos a una corte o cuando tenemos visita de nuestros abogados. They make me, they even make us um, undress and uh, show our anus, thank you, our anus in front of uh, the officers when we have to go to court or any proceedings. Incluso nos obligan a re y revisan minuciosamente nuestro órgano reproductivo masculino, haciéndonos quedar en ridículo y en vergüenza. They even uh, check our reproductive uh, organs and make us uh, feel very uh, embarrassed. Un, una cárcel en la cual no tienen ni tan siquiera la capacidad de entregarnos un suéter para soportar el frío debido al aire acondicionado fuerte que nos ponen. A jail where they can even give us a sweater in order to withstand the coldness that there is in this jail. Los oficiales hacen abuso de poder ya que no podemos nosotras expresar que se, algo está siendo injusto ya que lo único que buscan es poner cargos en nuestra contra para poder afectar nuestro caso. The officers abuse of their power where we cannot even um, say how they're abusing us and they just keep abusing us and abusing their power. Por esta y muchas otras razones, yo estoy en contra de que se expandan más espacios dentro de esa cárcel. For this and many other reasons, I'm against the expansion of this jail. Ya que somos tratadas como animales, estamos en una jaula prácticamente. We're treated by animals, we're basically in a cage. Y en vez de estar pensando en expandir más espacios, deberían de pensar en cerrar estos centros de detenciones, ya que nosotras no somos animales, estamos aquí pidiendo asilo y no tenemos por qué estar siendo tratadas de esta manera. And instead of us thinking about expanding this jail, you should be thinking of shutting it down because we're not animals, we're here seeking asylum, and we deserve dignity. Considero que si ustedes estuvieran en nuestro lugar, no soportarían la discriminación, el estigma y el trauma psicológico que causa para nosotras estar detenidas y estar siendo tratadas de esta manera. 
if you were in our place, you wouldn't stand the discrimination, the stigma, and the abuse that we face every day. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Thank you. An Angie, then Cecilia Iglesias, and then Marcela Hernandez. Good evening. Mayor Miguel Polito, members of the council, my name is Angie Cano. I'm a current resident of Santa Ana, and I am here to urge the members to vote against item 25D. Um, while we understand that jailing people has become profitable throughout the U.S., we urge you not to engage in, jail, in the jailing, prof, in the jailing um, business. Um, I also urge you to treat, um, to give the inmates that are now in the jail system to ensure their well-being before we bring more inmates to our jail. So please, uh, make sure, we want to urge you to make sure that those are well taken care of before we bring more people to the jail system. Thank you. Thank you, Cecilia, followed by Marcela. And after that, Saria Mojica. Good evening, um, Mayor Pulido, council members. Um, my name is Cecilia Iglesias. I have a resident of Santa Ana and also an immigrant here from, um, from the country of El Salvador. Been here since I was seven years old, and um, you know, just I wanted to come here and support for you not to expand the detention center. Because it's, what I'm hearing today, it's heartbreaking. Heartbreaking with all their testimonies, what they're saying, what's happening in the jail system. One of the things that I would urge you to, and I, and I wanna thank you for considering, which is um, you know, talking to the community, letting them see, and then letting, giving them their input, your, their input to you, to what it is that they, we want. You know, um, I always cringe when government tries to take over our lives. I, I don't think government should be dictating anything that we should be doing. But I, just the fact that this is a money-making deal, for me, it's wrong. It's wrong in all, in all levels. I don't think we should be in the business of making money out of our immigrant families. Not at all. Immigration, yeah, it needs to be reformed. I know there's a lot of things that we may, not, may agree or may not agree on how that's going to happen. But what we're doing here in Santana to our immigrant families, it goes against our values. Our values as immigrants, our values as even just Christians. You know, we have to take care of our brethren. And I don't think having them in jail is a, is a good start. I, you know, I applaud the, the reverend that came here and the ones the, um, with friends for the de detainees. They're showing their Christian and moral values. And I believe as in Santa Ana, especially Santa Ana, it's, you know, it's Saint Anne. You know, so we have to make sure that we express those convictions, those values that we have. So as a resident of Santa Ana, as a parent myself, you know, I, I would just, me being separated from my son, for me that would be heartbreaking. And I know many of our families, our immigrant families, that's what they face. They face the separation of families, and I don't think that's something that we should be doing. If anything, as you guys know, I'm on the school board in Santa Ana, and what we're doing is providing a good quality public education to our students. And that's, a, that's where we should be making, that's where we should be investing our resources. That which we should be putting in money to um, educate our students so we can provide them a good quality life here in America. Many of us as immigrants come here to have a better life, not to be detained and being put in a, in a system that's going to make us be treated as criminals. And if our only crime is coming here just to get a better life here in America. So thank you so much for allowing an opportunity and pulling this off. I believe that's what it is. You're pulling it off the, the item so you can have discussion with the community. I want to um, applaud you for that and commend you. And yes, take us into consideration. If you guys want more input, I am more than happy to be part of that committee. Thank you. Thank you, Cecilia. Uh, Marcela Hernandez, followed by Saria, followed by Lizette Diaz. Hi, yes, I'm here with the Immigrant Youth Coalition, what a statewide organization led by undocumented youth and families. Uh, we're here to uh, strongly oppose any more cages for our community, especially cages run by ICE. And we ask you that instead of considering an expansion with ICE, that you actually uh, terminate the contract that you currently have, where we are seeing um, our LGBTQ community being abused and tortured every day inside of these cages and jails. 
Um, we work with probably more than 150 families in deportation proceedings and detentions, and we know that ICE lies, ICE tortures our communities. Uh, we've seen people die under the custody of ICE, and we ask you today to stand with our communities and not with ICE. I'm undocumented, my parents are undocumented, and for you to even consider this kind of contract is a direct attack to me and my family and to all of our members that live here in Santa Ana. So we do urge you to uh, talk more with the people directly affected by it, to say no to this expansion and to terminate the current contract with ICE. Thank you. Thank you, Saria. Followed by Lizette. And after Lizette, Robert Denglin. Hi, good evening, uh, Council. My name is Sarai. Um, let's say that one more time, Sarai. Um, I'm undocumented, unafraid, queer and unashamed. Uh, I'm part of the Immigrant Youth Coalition. Uh, we're, uh, uh, Marcela forgot to mention, we're a queer youth-led uh, community organization um, that works closely with people in detention. Uh, I'm here to voice against the expansion of your detention center and the inhuman treatment of, tra of my trans family in your detention center. Um, ICE is not to be trusted, and ICE is making profit out of, our, of, of your abuse, of their abuse, and that you have uh, signed off on. We shouldn't be here asking you to not spend money to continue Santa Ana's uh, uh, treatment. Uh, you are you are in the hot seat, hot seat, and will continue to be if you agree to to this expansion and continue to keep the GBT pod. Uh, there is no humane to detain people, and I urge you strongly urge you to vote against it. Thank you. Lizette, followed by Robert, and then Igia. Mm -hmm. uh, Lizette, where is Lizette? Oh, I'm sorry. You're not Lizette. I know that. Please go ahead. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm here today as a community member, um, as the daughter of two undocumented um, individuals. I was raised here um, learning to speak Spanish and then later on learning to understand English. Um, I was born in 1990, the firstborn. As a firstborn, I didn't really understand what it meant for my parents to be undocumented. I never really understood what it meant until I started seeing what other people got compared to what I got. Um, so um, t by law, I am, who would you call it, an orphan? And I wouldn't want that to happen to anybody else. By coming to the United States, you're coming to seek safety, you're coming to seek the government that is supposed to protect these people. And for some reason or another, you get put into a detention center, which I've been in myself, which looks like a jail cell. Um, they're treated as a criminal because you shouldn't be coming to the United States and be put into a room to be by yourself. I remember um, Ellis Island was really popular as far as immigrating to the United States. I don't understand why our laws have changed. I don't understand why we treat somebody seeking safety as a criminal. I don't understand why we separate them by gender. And I don't understand why they don't get any daylight vitamin D, an essential human necessity. So I am asking you with my story and with the, with the families that you're possibly going to destroy, to not do so. Represent the people that are standing before you and say no. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Robert and Aya, I don't know which one wants to go first or second. You guys decide. Um, good evening, Mayor Polida and Santa Ana City Council. My name is Ilya Zeglin. I actually did not prepare for the speech, uh, but I want to start from comparison. My, my family are uh, descendants of Holocaust survivors. Uh, I see that a lot common now what's happened many years ago. 
when started to discriminate uh, disabled, Jews, LGBT, and I see why these people very proud, very honest coming, and we want to, that you will hear our voice. We are discriminated again, as was uh, in Nazi Germany started. I see a lot of similarity. You should listen what people tell. My family is protesting for starving, poisoning, disc uh, and exterminate, exterminating my son Nate. Now, today, they started another poisoning drug, Depakot. The dangers for Nate drug, which was forbidden for Nate's consumption by expert doctors because of previous devastating negative effect to Nate health and constitute a death sentence. This is a corruption. You know, I tell you many times, Orange County Regional Center is a corrupted organization. They corrupted judges like Kim Hubbard and Lee. They corrupted public defender like John Feldon. They corrupted a lot of officials. They, they making money and they destroying uh, people with disability. We are people minority. We hear that you would help us. You have to think not about how to raise your salaries. I am not jealous. You can make two times, three times more. But you cannot sit and listen how people are destroyed and killing because of the money. They are stealing our money. And we are very disturbed. Thank you. Hello, um, Honorable uh, Santa Ana City Council. This is Robert, uh, Robert Teglin, brother of Nate Teglin. Um, in parallel to uh, the plight of my brother, Nate Teglin, it's sort of different, but uh, <clears throat> the violation of his constitutional rights. Whereas, as you know, this uh, item that you're trying to pass of uh, violating the rights of uh, anybody within United States soil, whether it's whether they're citizens or not, is a violation of the Constitution. So it's completely unconstitutional, complete violation of your oath of office to uh, uh, your oath of office is <clears throat> not to uh, is one uh, one oath of office, and that's to uh, protect and defend the Constitution. With regard to my brother, he is a victim of um, illegal confinement and. Um, <clears throat> and a victim of torture and abuse, and now they put him on Depakote in, in addition to Zyprex in order to continue making money off of him and uh, overdosing him on these drugs and holding him in the Santa Ana group home against his will. And uh, it, it's a connection in the sense that <clears throat> both our uh, incentives are, I guess, for government to uh, benefit. My brother is uh, c uh, confined uh, in the Santa Ana group home and is receive uh, is receiving from the Department of Development Services fifty thousand dollars a month so it's a very big kickback to the uh, government officials and the police that uh, aside from a few police officers most of them have ignored his uh, plight and refused to remove him but that's also the fault of the Board of Supervisors but my my hope is that you wouldn't <clears throat> violate your constitution at least and uh, pass your bill where you want to violate the rights of uh, any, uh, me uh, the rights of the Constitution does not state in the Constitution for citizens of the United States. It's for all men are created equal and all of these rights are given to every person. So if they're on the United States soil, whether you like them or whether you don't like them, you have to protect their rights. And if you're not doing that and if you're uh, locking them up, killing them or <clears throat> doing anything, you're violating the rights of them as is my brother. So I hope my brother uh, could be released uh, from his confinement. Uh, but he's obviously a U.S. citizen. It's a different story, but everybody has equal rights, so that's why you shouldn't uh, pass your bill that would allow for more incarceration. Incarceration is a violation of the Constitution, and uh, so that's why it should be uh, the people who are incarcerated should be freed and uh, given equal rights to any person and should and any cruel and unusual punishment with regard to separating families or any of your constitutional the whole Constitution is being violated by passing this bill, so I would urge you to deny it, otherwise you're violating the Constitution and violating your oath of office. Thank you. Thank you.
Gemma, Gemma Suarez, followed by Alfredo Amesqua, and then uh, Marcela, I believe, Sasa. Alfredo, if uh, Gemma's not here, why don't you come on up, sir? Oh, she's here. All right, come on down. En español. Espérese un segundito, entonces. Okay. Can we get a translator down? Alfredo, why don't you speak and then we'll do the translation. Deje que hable otra persona mientras llega el traductor. All right, he's, we have our own. And, all right, he's coming. Empiece, <laughs> él la va a escuchar. Empiece. Okay. Estoy en solidaridad con la comunidad LGBTQ para asegurar su seguridad en las cárceles. Este, las condiciones en la cárcel deben mejorar. Estoy en contra de la expansión del contrato con ICE. Hemos exigido que cancelen el contrato con ICE y en vez de esto quieren expandirlo, en vez de cancelarlo. Esta cu cuestión no es solo de dinero, esta cuestión es de derechos humanos. Se trata de proteger a la gente trabajadora. La justicia trazada es justicia negada. No más detenidos migratorios. No más tráfico de humanos legalizado. Es todo. Gracias. I'm here in solidarity for the LGBTQ community. I'm here to support the safety of them uh, in, in jail. And I'm here to uh, ask for improved conditions in the jail. I'm here against uh, the, I, the, the continuation or the expansion of the ICE uh, contract. We came to demand that you end the contract and now you're, you're choosing to expand it. Um, we, I'm here to support uh, uh, human rights and justice delayed is justice denied. And I'm here against uh, uh, human trafficking. Thank you. Uh, now Alfredo Amesqua. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Fellow council members, let me um, share this with you. Um, those of you who have lived here all of your lives, or some of you who have lived here many, many years already, recognize that this is an immigrant city. This is about the second and third generation, many of your parents, brothers, sisters. We are the community. We are the community. And for those of you who are believing that this is the right step to take with ICE, let me tell you, this is not the right time. This is not the right perspective. I echo everything that has been said. So many personal stories, so many interesting issues that have been raised, and you have heard them before. And I would urge you that next time, whenever you hear your phone ring, don't answer it. You have to pay attention to our community, OK? So whatever you do. I served as an elected official many, many years ago, and believe me, that was one of the rules that we follow very closely. So let me tell you a little bit of perspective. This agreement with ICE is not a maker or breaker for our police department. This is not. In fact, this is a bad move because we're trying to develop a recognition of working together, community policing, community uh, relationships with our police department. This is not the right move, ladies and gentlemen. In fact, the right move would be is to cease and end the contract with ICE. That would be the right move because we definitely need to have a perspective that you as our elected officials are representing the interests of our community. And our community is an immigrant community, ladies and gentlemen parents, relatives, without mentioning any names, folks, we're talking about making sure that we make the right moves at the right time. There's a time and a place for everything. Let me give you another perspective. Whatever money we're going to get from ICE, it's not that significant. You guys have come a long, long way. So in the last two, three years, I have served with you in many instances. I have, I have worked with you, and you have come a long ways. You have made our city come in into the black, not anymore into the fact that we were in the red. So this is not going to bring a lot of money. This is going to hurt your perspective. This is going to hurt our city. And folks, I urge you, Michelle, Sal, Vince, David, Roman, 
Angelica and Miguel, you are our representatives of our Latino Hispanic community. I mean, there's not one city that has all of you. Please make the right move. And one more thing, finally. Even if you meet with the different members of our community, this is not going to reach a conclusion. I think you need to make a move. At this particular time, you should not extend the contract. You should not extend the contract. And furthermore, I would re re recommend that you order our wonderful city council full member, excuse me, a city manager, to actually work out a face-out plan so that, in fact, we do not have that in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now we have uh, Marcela Saba. Are these timed or? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Wasn't sure if there was a clock. It's my first time in the Santana City Council, folks. It's good to be uh, with so many community members and want to lend my voice to, to the chorus that is saying over and over in so many different ways in whatever language we can from our heart, from our minds, from our knowledge, from our ancestors that, of course, don't do this. Don't do this. And see another vision, see another way. Of course, terminate the current contract. Of course, imagine what it would be like to expand our health centers, our community centers, our schools, the spaces that we need to be focusing our time and energy. So I do also echo and feel the anger, the sadness, the disappointment, the frustration that this is being considered. And this is not the only space, the only city that's considering this horrible type of uh, continued business of the, our family's pain. I have a brother locked up. I know that when any of our family members are locked up, that's a whole family locked up. That's a whole community locked up. So I really hate, and I don't use that word hate often at all. I hate that you even call it to provide housing for federal inmates. Get that right. It's not housing. So don't lie to yourselves and your documents. This is not housing. And these are not beds. This is not 128 beds. That's 128 people. That's 128 families. That's 128 community members and multiplied by more. And we brought a lot of fire tonight. And if you dare pass this, you will see more fire and you will, you will not hear the end to this. And I promise you that. And that is guaranteed. So that you, when you're eating and when you're sleeping, the, the, the blood will be on your hands and you will see it and you'll remember it in every instance and in every move that you do. You have to do the right thing, folks. I do see, folks are echoing how many Reina, Benavides, Sarmiento, Tinajero, Martinez. I know, who are we talking to? These are, we're related, folks. Do not dare do this to your own people. Take a stance. Take it now. You're only alive once and you don't want this on your record. I don't want this on any, and this city's record. Y'all got to get on the right side with the people. So please do the right thing. Don't listen to the other interests. Don't listen to the other interests. Listen to the people who speak from the truth. Thank you. Thank you. At this point, uh, I have no more speakers, so I'm going to bring it back to council for discussion and consideration. Let's start on the right, and we'll come on down. Councilor Martinez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. To the last young lady, you start, you're very articulate. You have a lot of passion. You should run for office here in the city of Santana. We have a couple openings uh, this November. Um, I would like to thank you all. This is not an easy subject. For those of you that came here to provide your testimony, uh, it was heartfelt. Um, I, I am emotional to know that the despair and the fear that you are going through. I received the phone calls and I responded. As I responded in the past and as I respond here today, I do not support the expansion of ICE here in the city of Santana. I will not support a continuance. I will implore my colleagues to have the courage and stand up for what's right. The community is here already speaking to us loud and clear that they don't want the expansion of this contract. 
So what I'm going to do is do a substitute motion to deny the expansion of this contract here today. And ask our city manager to take a further action where you can get community input on what are the next steps to remove ICE completely from our police jail. That is the engagement that we need from our community. That's the kinds of conversations they want to have with this city council and this city manager. And let me tell you and let me be very clear with you all up here and to our police chief and our city manager. Our employees who work at the Santa Ana Jail, they're hardworking people. I understand that we have made transitions of moving them from new, new detention officers that are coming into our police department to part-time because we had a plan. When we were having discussions with the community, we were saying that we were going to remove ourselves and we were going to put a plan together to remove ourselves from ICE. This is not a plan of removing. This is expanding. So I'm not sure what happened, Mr. City Manager, in your conversations with our police chief to have this contract before us here today. What I would ask is that you find solutions with our police chief because he's a very intelligent man. He has the right resources in his police department to figure out a strategy of how we can possibly sustain the jail without using federal dollars. I believe that if this city council wants to be in the business in the jail business. We have to sustain it here with the monies that we have. And if we do not have the monies, we then need to make the next steps, the most rational and objective steps to get out of that business and figure out how can we put those employees that work in our jail into other departments or within our police department. Or better yet, why don't we use the Orange County, you know, the Orange County Sheriff's Department is having difficulties within their jail. As you all know, the recent incidents, they're, they're not going to escape from the Santa Ana jail. So why don't we partner up with the Orange County Sheriff's Department and, and, and use those inmates to be housed in, in our facility if that's going to be the case, if we, we can't find sustainability purposes. And so that is my motion on the table, Mr. Mayor. You know what? I may be the minority here today, and I'm okay with that because at the end of the day, my integrity my values stand strong with this community and that's the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now I'm going to call on uh, Councilmember Salty and I head on. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you for everyone who came out tonight and uh, the testimonies today. Um, let me start by saying that we were, uh, well, the thought was to pull this item have more dialogue with the community and bring it back. Um, after hearing the testimony, I think that my position is going to be to reject this item and vote no. <laughs> and continue to have dialogue. I think that the time is past due uh, for our uh, transgender community, our gay, lesbian, trans transgender community uh, to be marginalized in the way that they are. It's tough enough to live with the stigma that is even in our own society, in our own community. Um, we need more people to come out and talk about their experiences. There was this um, case a few years ago where there was a private jail and teenagers were placed in that jail and the judge was getting kickbacks on the side because of that. Uh, be, you know, and, and they were keeping kids longer than they were supposed to. And people came up and spoke just like you did, but nobody listened. And years later, uh, these kids came together and they, they filed a class action suit. That judge is now in prison. Many people went to jail. Uh, but it should have never taken that long to have that dialogue. We should have had that dialogue. I'm, I'm a big boy. I've been here a long time and I know that uh, we can't always just believe that there's nothing wrong within the system. We can't believe that people aren't violated or that they're making these stories up. As I was listening to the testimony, as I was listening to the different folks come up, I think the more responsible thing to do is to reject this now, 
have the dialogue, continue to work on a better solution, and I think that builds trust with the community, and then we're moving in the right direction. Thank you. With, with that, let me go ahead. So I, I, I don't know exactly the motion. Would you mind if I make a what, motion? Why don't I, I, we no, wait, let's let, hear from others and then we'll come back. Okay, and let's do that. Because I want others to have a chance to speak. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I think, I think you're both saying the same thing. So um, I'm supportive of what uh, they said. So. Um, What, um, what we have to understand is that not everything on the agenda gets adopted. So that's why it's a request for consideration. That doesn't mean that it's a given that it's going to be a done deal. But this is why there, you know, we live in a democracy, so we can listen, so we can understand, we can hear. We don't always agree with staff. We don't always agree with members of the public that come before us. But this is the dialogue that we should be having. So um, I agree that there's got to be continued dialogue. Um, uh, you know, I think there's, I, I would take it one step further because I think a comment was made about the problems that, are, that they're having across the street at the county jail, and I certainly don't want us to um, have any similar issues, and I think we don't. I think ours is very distinguishable. We have, um, we have I think, uh, a facility that's much, much different, but it did trouble me to hear that um, folks get released out in the street uh, in the middle of the night. Um, and um, it, you know in the dark and I've always been critical of what the county does when they release folks who have nothing to do with Santa Ana and they just get dropped in our city and we have to absorb a lot of those folks who live elsewhere but because we're the county seat and because we um, have the um, county facility here we have to deal with the consequences of that um, the strip searches the um, lack of dignity and respect that's shown to detainees um, and folks who are being um, you know, uh, incarcerated is troubling as well. So I would just compel the, um, you know, the um, chief to look into that. I have full confidence that his staff and his personnel, um, you know, will, you know, make sure that that doesn't occur because they have, uh, you know, conducted themselves at such a high level that um, it is, you know, it is troubling. So I, I do want to compel the, the chief and the city manager to look into that. In fact, if they're, if any of that uh, is occurring but I think um, you know what we want to do is continue this and we realize that what the end here is to eventually disengage and we've had this conversation this isn't something that's novel we, we've spoken so we know that we slowly are going to be disengaging with this and again I think that this is going to be a much better path to just uh, not adopt tonight not move forward and um, and continue the dialogue that we need to have with the community Thank you. Now let me go to the left. Uh, Angie Amesco, please. Thank you, Mayor. First of all, I want to thank all of you that came out to speak tonight. A, a lot, many of you shared uh, very personal stories, very compelling. And at this point, I also agree with my colleagues that it's not the right timing. Um, I believe that we need to continue to work uh, together in order to end the ICE contract responsibly. So I hope we continue to work towards that goal. Thank you. Roman Reina, please. You know, unfortunately, I've had a, a family member incarcerated many times, and it does affect the entire family. So I, I've lived this firsthand, and, and I'll definitely be brief. So I, I could relate to a lot of the stories that were being said. It, it brought back vivid memories of, of the hardships my family went through, and it's definitely horrible. Uh, at the same time, I agree with a lot of what my colleagues mentioned. And at the time, I, I really don't think at this point there's anything else to say. I think we should just take the vote. Thank you, Councilman Benavides. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, you know, I was in a in a conversation uh, with with my colleagues here on the on the the dais and the police chief, city manager, uh, when we took a trip to Washington D.C. a few months ago. Uh, met with uh, numerous different agencies, uh, a, a number of different things, transportation, uh, affordable housing, uh, homeless uh, deal, uh, needs of the homeless community. Uh, we also met with Department of Homeland Security, a number of different things. Uh, uh, and one of those was where they raised this issue of uh, looking for a place to be able to uh, house 
uh, transgender detainees, and, and they identified the city of Santa Ana and our, our detention facility as one that they wanted to be able to expand. They recognized that it is a vulnerable population, and they wanted to make sure that there was a uh, that they were better able to better uh, serve and and detain uh, and house uh, those detainees. Uh, if we as this this issue is one that's clearly very sensitive, you know, they're, they're, uh, it's one that's very personal, uh, and uh, and again, it, it's a vulnerable community. Part of the way I was wrestling with this and thinking through it coming into the meeting, uh, if we were to consider this, is uh, is there a way for us in the city of Santa Ana to be? Folks are going to be detained and held somewhere, uh, and would it be the case where the city of Santa Ana would uh, be able to be? A place that would be noticed uh, for providing a dignified, respectful way to be able to uh, for people to be housed. Uh, if if folks are not going to be detained or held here, they're going to be detained, held somewhere else, and potentially uh, it's uh, uh, it's we talk about uh, the issue of uh, people being able to be visited by families and such, and, and so uh, I, I don't think it's a black and white issue. Uh, the the issue of the uh, the potential um, additional revenue of 2.2 million dollars. The reason that we're in this contract uh, is because we have this this debt from when we built uh, the city built the facility back uh, about 20 years ago or so. Uh, one of the things that I was looking at as well is for us to consider if we were to be able to uh, have additional dollars come in, where the federal government would essentially be able to help us get out, kind of reverse the situation and get out of the situation, uh, out of the debt, and then, and then out of this contract, basically expedite um, the process. Uh, clearly, the, the, uh, there are, uh, again, it's not black and white. Uh, there are different uh, things to consider uh, when any, any Please, item, let's any be issue, respectful. Uh, that, we're, that we're considering uh, here on the council. And it, it's, it's, it, it's something that one can look at uh, from a one-sided perspective, uh, but the reality is that there are two sides to every, every situation. Ultimately, at the end of the day, whether uh, we could uh, potentially move forward, uh, and there are reasons to be able to do that, there are reasons for us not to be able to, to, to not move forward. In this case, I think uh, you know, the, the, the overall sentiment definitely from the community and uh, from uh, the, the council here is that this is not something that there is there is no interest to to move forward uh, with this. However, the main thing that I think going forward, it's not just about uh, the item and the action that we take tonight. Uh, if this is voted down, uh, there are still matters and issues that were presented um, here tonight. Uh, I, I serve on the public safety committee. Uh, some of these issues of uh, of searches of when folks are released. I did have an opportunity to talk to the police chief a bit about this uh, on the side. I think that there are things that we do need to communicate both to, to the public to be able to uh, ensure that uh, what we are providing is uh, uh, respectful uh, ways to be able to, to treat uh, people here uh, that are being detained. So ultimately, there are still concerns that I think need, need to be addressed. I'm going to ask that we agendize this item to be able to be discussed. Uh, and that we do have continued dialogue and correct any uh, thing that we might need to do to be able to uh, ensure that we're moving forward with building trust rather than breaking down the trust of of, uh, of the public. So that, that's where I'll end my comments. Thank you. Let me now uh, make comment, and then um, I believe we'll go forward with, uh, with a motion. Um, if we look at the recommended action, what it specifically says is to authorize city manager and clerk of the council to execute a five-year amendment beginning February 2nd, 2016, terminating June 30th, 2020, with uh, U.S. Immigration Customs Enforcement. And what it specifically talks about is a uh, 128-bed guarantee, increasing the maximum number of ICE detainees from 200 to 300. So I believe if we don't approve this tonight, we've got to go back to the city manager and tell them, you know, come back with a plan and, um, and, and, and some reaction because we can't just go into free fall. And by the way, I, I, I hear what you all said, and I agree that we don't have to approve this tonight. And I think, I think we should not do the recommended action. And, um, but then as a follow-up, we can't just go into free fall. We have to have 
you know, some, some plan and some approach. Do you have any comment? Then I have a couple more comments myself. Please, Ms. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. And you and I have talked about the jail operation in the past, and I thank all the council. And uh, we have been working to uh, improve our options going forward. Uh, as soon as I became city manager, we haven't hired one full-time correctional officer because we knew this was not sustainable. Uh, and there are a lot of employees involved in this decision. I don't believe we should be in the jail business. I've said that since I got here from day one. We got into this business for a lot of different reasons. Unfortunately, uh, we do have a $27 million debt uh, that we need to pay. Whether we're in jail or not, we have to pay that, that debt. And so I do ask uh, the council, uh, per the recommendation, that I be given uh, some time to come back with options. The staff presented the transgender option. We're not asking for more beds. If, we don't, if you don't approve that tonight, we completely understand that. And we do ask, and I took notes, Mayor and Council, that we try and get ideas uh, from the community, that we look for solutions. Uh, and there's a lot of miscommunication going on in terms of, of where this money could go. The, the reality is this money can't go for parks. This can't go for community centers. There is no money to do that, and I think everybody knows that. But you're, you're absolutely right, uh, Mayor. Uh, we can't go into a free fall. And we would like some time to uh, to come back with if, if Let me just ask another couple questions. I know when we first built the jail, you just mentioned $27 million. Originally, it was $128 million. So we've paid $101 million back in terms of, of the debt. And once it's completely gone, there's going to be a lot less pressure. Also, you know, there, there, I think there can be, you know, humane uh, you know, jails. I think we run a fairly good jail. I visited a lot myself just because I, I give tours to people, and believe me, it's direct supervision. It's much better than many other jails that are out there. And, and as long as people are, you know, getting in trouble or misbehaving, we need as society jails. I don't think anybody's saying, you know, do away with all of them. But we don't need, you know, this contract with ICE, I don't believe. And we need to treat everybody correctly, I believe. And, and so I, I agree with my uh, colleague to the left, Councilor Benavides, that dialogue is important. So what I would recommend today, if the council agrees, is that we you know, deny 25D, um, give the city manager some time, whatever he believes is appropriate, to come back with ideas. I don't know if folks want to have a study session in addition to that, but in essence, um, I'd be you know either recommending or would like Councilor Martinez to make a motion uh, that uh, that denies uh, and says no to this uh, action tonight. I think there's a motion on the floor uh, that uh, there's a I, I can't hear because there's people. There's a motion on the floor by Councilor. And you seconded Martinez. it, right? No, I'll second that motion. All right. So with that, those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries unanimously. So with that, Madam Clerk, um, I'm going to go back to the consent calendar and ask uh, the city attorney if there's anything to report out of closed session. It's over. You guys won. Congratulations. <laughs> Anything to report, Madam City Attorney? Mayor, Council Members, members of the public, we had um, three uh, closed session items. We have no reportable action. On All right. Items. So with that, uh, Madam uh, Clerk. Uh, All right, let's do eight more comments, then we'll rock and roll. Trevor Ickle, are you here? Please come to the microphone. Speak up. And guys in the back, try to keep it down, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm a you. teacher. I, I could be loud. <laughs> My name is uh, Trevor Ikes. Um, I'm here tonight to talk in, uh, about um, a project that's going on over in Ward 1, um, which is the um, conditional use permit for a 60-unit, um, 200-bed um, drug and rehab facility that's going to go on um, at Washington Place. Um, it's something that's before the Planning Commission right now. We had a community meeting last week on Thursday when Solid Landings, the company that's putting together this facility, sent out their mailer for the community. Um, it was disguised as basically junk mail. It was an un, um, 
basically a, a blank envelope that was put uh, put to the residents of the uh, of the area uh, on Linwood Avenue um, in Marbury Park, and basically the majority of the residents threw away that mailer. Uh, fortunately, we were able to communicate with our neighbors, and we had over 250 residents that attended that community meeting where we heard solid landings talk about how our property values, um, the uh, traffic congestion on Grand Avenue would be eliminated by allowing them to come in there and um, operate their facility. My, my comment to you as the uh, council members tonight and to you, Mr. Mayor, is if a 128 bed expansion at the jail is something that you guys are against, I hope that you're against a 200 bed drug and rehab facility in my neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jeff uh, Heilson. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and uh, council members. Uh, got some good news for you. I am uh, heterosexual. I don't have any problems. Uh, not here to ask you for any money, to spend any money. We don't need hormone therapy in the middle of the night or free dental or medical treatment. But uh, like the gentleman before me, we do have a legitimate concern. I represent uh, a, a number of concerned homeowners in the Mayberry Park Association. We're concerned about a number of things, primarily uh, trying to preserve the values of our homes in this area and our personal safety not only just ourselves, but our children and grandchildren. There are, um, there's a proposal, it's not a done deal, but a proposal to build a, uh, or renovate this 60-unit uh, apartment building and put in uh, drug offenders, uh, not only drug offenders, but uh, DUI people, uh, people uh, who also, according to the Rock Solid Recovery's website, is, include uh, people with sexual addictions. So we, uh, I think we all agree that uh, if you were to look for a house, would you look for a house, would you look favorably upon a, a house that on the other side of that back fence was a rehab center with 200 or more uh, offenders of various crimes? Uh, we have, uh, as the pre previous gentleman said, there was a meeting last Thursday night uh, the, in which more than 200 people showed up and said they're not for this project. And uh, f quite frankly, we're not all, all attorneys. We don't know what to do except to come to the council and ask for your help in, number one, keeping our area, our neighborhood, a residential area and not a commercial establishment. Okay, so we want the zoning to remain as it is, residential. Um, also, um, we want to uh, uh, somehow address the Planning Commission to do whatever we can to stop this project. Um, these people who've purchased this property even though it's not approved, have already sent out eviction notices to the people. They're so rock solid sure they're going to get this pounded through the Planning Commission, they, they're starting to evict people. Now again, I represent a very large community of registered voters here, tax-paying citizens. We're not asking for money. We don't want the property values to go down. We're proud to pay our full share of property taxes on the current value. So we would ask you guys to vote no on changing the, the zoning for that and do whatever you can to exert your influence with the Planning Commission to keep our neighborhood residential. Thank you. Thank you, Acelia Segura, followed by Mary Lou Ontiveros. Um, good evening. My name is Mary Lou Ontiveros, and I live uh, in Santa Ana on East 14th Street near the Mauna Loa Apartments um, that's located at 1311 East Washington Street, where Solid uh, Landing Behavioral Health is proposing to open a drug and rehab center. 
I'm here to voice my concern. As the other two gentlemen stated, they're concerned about, uh, you know, different things, you know, the property value. And, and, and first and foremost, the safety of our children, because when they, the, at the meeting on Thursday night, they were saying that, I, you know, I asked um, whether there was going to be, what kind of people were going to be there, if there was going to be, like, serious um, um, crime, uh, people who committed serious crimes, um, and people or people who committed sexual crimes against ch children, and they weren't able to say yes or no, but they said that there was going to be different kinds of people. And you know, um, in our area, the children, there's, ki uh, there's kids that from kindergarten to 12th grade who attend Century High School, who attend, attend Sierra, Sierra uh, Intermediate, who attend Hoover, and on um, right across the street from the proposed um, center is a lady that has a um, licensed daycare center. So we're really, really concerned and uh, we want to propose that this does not happen. San I've lived in Santa Ana for many years. Um, I work in Santa Ana. Actually, I work for Santa Ana Unified, you know, and you know what? I don't plan to go anywhere. And like the gentleman says, you know, we pay our taxes, we pay our property taxes, we do what it, it, it takes to keep Santa Ana uh, uh, making it better. And I think that um, if this happens, it's going to cause a lot of problems for Santa Ana. I don't know anything about the money, if money will come in, if this big business comes, um, comes into our city, but I'll tell you, it's going to make it, I feel like it's a dumping ground. Santa Ana is not a dumping ground, you know. We want to make it, um, make it better. And so I ask you guys, when this comes up, please say no. Vote it out. We really need your help. And, and the people in Santa Ana need your help. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, I believe Mary Lou. Oh, that was me. The Antiveros or Hortensia de la Torre. Hortensia. De la Torres. Ah, buenas noches, señor alcalde y miembros del jurado. I'm going to translate for her. Go ahead. Okay. Just do it while she's talking every so often break. La razón por la que estoy aquí es para referirme al contrato del que acaba de hablar mi vecina. The reason that I'm here for it's referring the uh, contract that my neighbor has just talked about. Nuestra área es muy transitada por muchas personas mayores de edad. Our area is uh, very uh, transitada. Transited from uh, with a lot of people that's always uh, in the area walking. Que llevan a los niños a las escuelas. They take their kids to school. Que salen a comprar sus comidas a la marqueta. They go out to the market, buy food. Y les pedimos especialmente que nos apoyen a que no pase este proyecto. And we ask that you please help us for this project not to go through. Este lugar de, de Santana es un lugar muy, muy tranquilo. Y si ese proyecto pasa. Santa Ana is a very quiet area. Si ese proyecto llega a suceder, van a empeorar el área. If this was to happen, uh, the area will get worse. Y lastimar muy profundamente a todos los que vivimos en ella. And everyone there would be very hurt, all the people that live in the area. Gracias. Thank you. Gracias. Aya, Tenglin, and Robert, you guys want to speak on this? Your cards are up here again. Or, or whatever, this is just public comment. You can speak whatever you want to speak on. Uh, good, good evening, Mayor Pulido and uh, Santa Ana Council members. By the way, it's Pulido. You always I'm say Pulida. Pulida. Pulido. Pulido, I'm sorry. You got it. Yes, but a few seconds more, you have to add me. We'll give you the seconds back. Okay, thank you. Uh, you see, I today even don't ask you that I sign for four speeches because today a lot of people I understand that uh, you have to accommodate. Uh, so my reason, the main reason, I want to that you will see it. I'm coming here not for any other reason that save life of my disabled son. 
that Orange County Regional Center corrupted organization that I repeat many times, they are making money on disabled by stealing this money. They, I don't know what is the way, but they bribe the judges, they bribe defenders, they bribe, I, I don't know what is the way, but I'm sorry to say police, because no one stay to protect right disabled. My son is actually killing they, they are killing my son by poisoning him with the drugs and taking money to their pocket instead of treatment. I am representing not only my son, I am representing disabled families. They are suffering from this criminal from Orange County Regional Center Management and DDS who receiving public money Billions of dollars they putting their pocket and they mistreating and dis uh, discriminating and exterminating disabled people. I don't know what, how, how can I say that. If you have uh, any doubt, I have all facts to prove. We coming to the court, they, in the court, Judge Kim Hubbard and Lee, they just despicable people. I don't know how much they corrupted, how many bribes they got, but they just don't respect law and constitution. They make special reason that court closed from public, and what they do, they have a kangaroo court. Everything what they doing there, they lying. They they inviting police that lying. They are writing public defender that misrepresenting uh, disabled people. My son, my son coming and say in the court, I want my parent be conservator. And public defender say, no, he doesn't want. I mean, so open lie and corruption. You, if you don't believe me, I have facts, but I want somebody would listen to me. City manager. He knows that many decent people ask him to find a public defender. I don't have a, a decent attorney. Why he cannot find it? Uh, yeah, if you can, I've given you a little bit more time. Now I'll let Robert continue. Hello, Honorable Santa Ana City Council members. This is Robert Seglin, brother of Nate Seglin. Um, as this uh, picture of my brother, Nate Seglin, uh, he was uh, basically kidnapped by the uh, Irvine Police Department. Um, in a, this is a new article that was written on him about just yesterday, uh, I mean today. Um, medically kidnapped, disabled man held against his will in Orange County. So he was <clears throat> broken to the home, the uh, Irvine Police. This is a crime, the organized crime that you inherited. So it's not the fault of the Santa Police that he was kidnapped. That was in Irvine. but. It is the fault of the Santa Ana police to fail to uh, <clears throat> remove him from his current residence where he's being uh, choked and tortured and over-medicated. Obviously, the judge, the judges there whether uh, are, are responsible for the crime and will continue petitioning the judges. They have to, by, a pro by the probate code and by the Constitution, they have to <clears throat> uh, grant uh, family members as conservators. By the Constitution, they have to not allow a person to be uh, illegally incarcerated. By the Constitution, they, uh, you can't allow uh, cruel and unusual punishment, Eighth Amendment, uh, breaking into the home, kidnapping, Fourth Amendment. Uh, that, was the, or, that was the crime of the Irvine Police Department and the Irvine par paramedics who tied him to a gurney. So this is a <clears throat> very, uh, very big organized crime in Orange County. Why they targeted my brother is uh, probably from pr profit reasons. I don't know any other reason why he would be held in a group home against his will, choked and tortured and poisoned to death, which would be an <clears throat> enormous liability to the Santa Ana uh, government. And uh, it, that's why it's, it should be your, um, your goal to uh, <clears throat> do everything in your power to release him. Certainly you don't have uh, the right to t order the judge to make any decision which way or that way, and you don't have uh, jurisdiction over the uh, corrupted uh, public defender's office, but you do have jurisdiction over the police department, and the police department has to, um, and they did one time do their job. They interviewed my brother, uh, 
two, uh, one officer, uh, Officer Rias, and he interviewed him for 30 minutes and he described abuse and torture and then they called the Adult Protective Services, they refused to remove him. So the police, some of the police who want to do the right thing don't know where to, do, they don't know where to bring him. So it has to be coordinated with the Orange County, uh, I mean the Orange County, the Board of Supervisors and your police department and together they have to release him in order to uh, save his life and in order to uh, avoid incurring liability and so that he can be removed from this uh, environment of organized crime and it's very easy to solve. Uh, they have to give conservatorship to me as his brother or any other family member and they have to, uh, the uh, corrupt and criminal organization of the Department of Elemental Services who are using, who are basically throwing $50,000 a month so that these people can get this funding are incurring liability to you and are incurring liability to the Board of Supervisors and it, it's not fair to you but it certainly is your duty to uh, work with the Board of Supervisors to have him released as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. With that, uh, I'm going to bring our attention to the consent calendar. Are there any items council members Mr. would like to pull on the consent calendar? Mr. Mayor, I have a yes. couple items. Yes, go ahead. 19D, 22A, 22B, 25A, and um, 25D was we already took an action on that. So. All right, any other items? Not, I'd entertain a motion on the bill. Sorry, ballot. go ahead, Mayor Pro Tem. 25B, Mr. Mayor. B is a boy. Any other items? I'd entertain a motion on the balance. So, so move. move. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. Uh, 25D, Councilor Martinez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My first item is 19D, and um, that item is specifically, it's just a receive and file, but I wanted just to bring this to our attention as. Um, our uh, public works director has done a wonderful job at finally providing us monthly updates on where are we at with our CIP program. Um, Mr. Uh, public works director, um, I, I have a couple questions for you um, as it um, pertains to the um, current, our CIP is a seven year plan for those in the community who are in the audience may not understand what a capital improvement project is. It's not tied to our, to our, um, uh, to our general um, a budget, but it is separated, and, and most of our funds either come through Measure M or grants, um, or through enterprise funds. And so, ver various sources are tied to our capital improvement project. I do have some concerns as it pertains, as as you all know, you know, our assets and our infrastructure are ones that um, we should take care of and maintain and, 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 and being good stewards of, of our funds and making sure that we should not build any new roads or, or, or any new infrastructure if we don't have money to maintain and operate those facilities or, or those specific assets. And so the city for a long period of time until you know, we have this public works director that is doing a, a phenomenal job and, and I just want to thank him that he's now shedding light to, to certain issues that, 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 that we do have as we move forward with this seven year plan, Mr. Uh, Public Works Director, you, you will see the amount of money that it costs to maintain, and it's in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And, you know, as I look at transportation, and I was recently at the California League of Cities, and we are all experiencing this, and I think everyone's celebrating that, you know, commodities are down, and specifically oil, and so gas prices are very low right now, and, but there's a problem with that. Because our gas tax is tied. That's how cities, municipalities receive money to fund our roads. And things are changing drastically. Um, at the federal level, there is a little bit of stability, um, but there needs to be definitely major changes, not reforms, changes to the current system that we have in place. But at the state level is where I do have concern. And, and moving forward as a city, as I look at the um, the liabilities of our assets and wanting to maintain, I'm wanting to make sure um, that we as a council understand that as we move forward, and, 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 and right now there are a couple of developments and affordable housing that are coming into play, a couple of development projects, um, that there is going to be a burden as it pertains to our infrastructure. And are we going to be able to maintain that system? I've sent various emails to our city manager and to our staff and, and figuring out some policies of how we're going to be able to pay for these infrastructure costs. Um, and so, Mr. Mr. Public Works Director, one, I would like for um, you to tell me 
and, and hopefully in the future, um, as the conversations start to have at the a state level, how the gas tax could possibly affect you know, the revenues that come to us as a city and how that will affect your department, in particular our capital improvement uh, a project to maintain our current roads. As, as many of the residents know, um, you know, we repaired over three to 400 miles of roads um, and that was just hundreds of millions of dollars to, to fix those roads. But there was no money to maintain, to maintain them. And so we were, we've been counting on gas tax and other grants to fund those. That may change. And so we need to be very sensitive that, to that and have some kind of discussion of what are the next steps to assuring that we're able to maintain you know, our, our streets and our roads. Thank you, Mayor. Pro tem and members of council, uh, very good uh, question and concern. As you know, uh, the, our infrastructure, especially our roads, were underfunded. And the funding that was coming through Major M and other gas sources, they were not nearly enough to maintain the streets. Um, we, uh, we will show later to council, we go into detail about what it costs to delay the repairs, somewhere around 30 to $40 million. Um, additional cost every year we uh, delay uh, maintaining our roads. Um, those are all the bad news. The gas, the, the uh, you know, the gas money is not uh, coming in the way we, we expected. But you know, the good part is the you know the gas is used for the base of asphalt, and uh, you know, hopefully the, uh, the the cost of the pavement itself would go down a little bit. That will help. Uh, the good news is we have the pavement management program that we've been working on for last year. Uh, I think you, you were uh, preview, but part of it. Uh, the program would uh, associate a number of different uh, uh, sources that cause the degradation of the streets and uh, would, would consolidate the, the cost and we'll be able to, with support of the council, we'll be able to uh, address our, our need and be able to have enough funding to um, uh, not only repair the rest of our streets, uh, which is half of our streets that are in need of repairs, but also would have enough uh, funding to provide the maintenance in perpetuity. And so that's, we've been working on the program. We're expecting that to come to council within next two months. We would take it to subcommittee. And, uh, we've been working with the city manager's office on that, and then we also city attorney's office to uh, kind of uh, remove some of the issues that we have and get it get it ready for council. Great, thank you for the update. Appreciate that. Thank sure. you. Uh, the next item, Mr. Mayor, is 22A. Uh, Councilwoman, do you want to take uh, there take was an a action? receiving file? Okay, so yeah. we're on uh, 22A. Yes. Um, so 22A is an, R, is an RFP, which um, I think this is coming through Hidardo's department. I had a quick question, and I, I do want to thank staff that we will be providing food to um, during our community engagement process. Um, um, but I was wondering why we did not go through an RFP process. Um, and so I know the money is, is, is not significant, but just making sure that... Um, you know, we continue to move forward and be transparent and open, and so it, maybe it, it is Fran, and um, so I'm not sure why. And so it's 22A is, is sun-dry food and paper goods to provide participants during various city-sponsored events. Um, and so um, I, I just asked the question, why did we not go through an RFP process? What we, uh, good evening, Mayor and City Council members. In terms of this item, it's, uh, we actually do a survey of surrounding um, like grocery stores or, or, or um, in, like companies like Smart and Final that can actually provide these types of goods and services. The problem that we encounter often is that they're not willing, for example, to take an invoice and bill us later. They want kind of their cash at that point in time. Or they're not willing to take a material release form. And uh, you know, ten, uh, usually um, when we get items, they're in bulk. And Smart and Final is probably one of the few, if the only institution that we've found that has, has provided us like a charging account. So we're able to go and purchase our stuff, and it's kind of like a revolving credit with them. That's the difficulty part with this. That's why it's hard to issue an RFP or find 
um, institutions that would actually delay have a delayed payment program. So I'm not sure if this is this is a standard across you know municipalities and the problems that we face. And I'm just wanting to make sure that we're open, we're transparent, and we actually have a process. What you're asking for us today is for forty five thousand in total, not to exceed one hundred and thirty five thousand. And again, just to be a responsible steward, I ask these questions that are they're important. Um, th these are not my dollars; these are the pu public fund dollars, and we have to ask these questions. So I'm not trying to be sinister That's or okay. you know, or, or or, you know, really, you know, telling you that you're doing something wrong, but it's something that needs to be raised. And secondly, the food that we're providing to to our residents based on the, 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 the money that you're asking here, that I would ask that, um, one, that it's bought here locally in the city of Santa Ana, and or two, making sure that we do provide healthy options. Um, and so as we move forward to building a healthier community, and we've signed on to that, wanting to make sure that we are able to provide healthy options to our constituents. Yeah, the Smart and Final that we go to is in Santa Ana, and they have a great produce section, fruit and vegetables. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. Move the item. Is there a second? Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Let's oppose. Motion carries unanimously. I believe you have the next one. Yes, 22B, and that's where really quickly, and I'm, I'm supportive of this, and 22B is to the rehab a portion of... of of, of really some of our lateral um, lines. And just very quickly, I just wanted to make sure us approving this contract, and that is really to, um, I wanted to know if we have any specific locations of what residents are going to be working with. Again, I'm wanting to make sure that it's equitable, and I know that um, what we're doing here today is to rehab portion of the sanitation sewer lines, but certain laterals within residential areas. And so I'm wanting to make sure that not only the north side of 17 is, is getting fixed, but that we're equitable and we go across the city and making those repairs that was not put on on, on the memo and so I'm asking you um, out here publicly that we have an equitable process and that you know um, uh, residents that have issues whether in the south central part or north part of, of town that um, we're also assisting them to fix these lateral lines and I, I hear I see our public works director shaking his head and so I just and I see the city manager and just wanting to make sure that that is the case um, and with that being said I'll move the item is there a second second those in favor please say aye aye, aye. those opposed motion carry so now 25a mr. mayor Go ahead. And this is an issue that I've brought up for the past four years on this city council and today I, I will be a, a, a probably a, the only no vote on this and this is um, the information technology service to extend another six million dollars to, to extend another six months for over a million dollars and you know we now have um, have our new um, IT chief officer and he, he started two weeks ago if, um, and you know we're taking strides we did our IT strategic plan I just think we, we've been able, we continued the last six months here we are continuing another six months and you look at our return on investment and now that we do have a plan I'm just not sure that it will take six months to get this person who, who we just recently hired, and I know he's fairly new, but he's been in the business quite a long time, that it would take him six months to find a transition period and for this amount of money. I have to tell you, there's a lot of disappointment um, for me and the, and, and, and the services that we utilize with these contractors and what they've been able to really put out for that much money. It's been in the, in the tens to 20 millions of dollars that we have allocated over and over again. And so my frustration, and one, I'm excited that we, we now have this person that is going to guide us to assuring that we spend, you know, our, our funds correctly and that we hire the right staff and, and, and the right firms to provide the services that are needed for the city. But I still have concerns. I personally think that we don't need six months, but I would like for the city manager or our new IT person to address this, that why are we asking for another six month extension? I understand you're going to tell me that the guy just started, but will it take six months to figure that out? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilman Martinez. And Mayor, the, the answer is yes. We need the time. Uh, I met with uh, Jack. He's only been on the job for how many days? Two days, not two weeks. <laughs> so that hopefully that's taken into consideration. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, I think he was surprised by how actually low the contract was and how few people were, are working on this. They have about eight times as many people in Long Beach for a similar size city. So I uh, understand the concern. I think we keep coming back every six months. I think we need to be orderly and do this right. 
Uh, we do have a valuable consulting contract. I'm very confident in uh, Mr. Mr. Shula, uh, and, I, and I asked the council for some time to, to make a transition. We hope it's not more than six months, but we need at least six months to, to make an intelligent decision. So that's our well, feedback. Well, thank you, Mr. City Manager. At this time, I won't be supporting this action um, just for the reasons that I stated here today and the various um, probably three times that we've had extensions. Um, and so with that being said, Mr. Mayor, I think you guys need to take a, mo uh, take All a motion. All right. So um, you're a no vote. Yes. Uh, is, is there a motion from anybody else? Motion Move the item. To approve. We have a motion and a second. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 No. Those opposed? Motion carries. There was one no vote. Uh, 25 uh, B, I believe, uh, Mayor Pro Tem had. Why don't we go to that? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's just a very brief question for the um, director. I wanted. I thought we had already moved this item, and I thought this was um, this already was disposed of, and we were moving forward. Did we have to come back um, for any reason? Or well, prior you did a, a pre-commitment. So now this is actually the loan documents for the inclusionary funds in CDBG. You will see additional loan documents for this project for home once all of the other financing is in place as home is passed in. Got it. So it's going to come back to us again, right? Yeah, one more time. And this is some of the in lieu fees being um, addressed for the project over on Main and 17th, is that correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to see how many units there? Of, um, you are going to see... It, is it 57? 57. Okay. And, um, and this is going to be with the goal to introduce um, some housing opportunities, affordable housing opportunities for artists. Correct. Yes. Good. And we know, and just so we know, I know the city attorney probably gets nervous when we do any, um, you, know, uh, you know, guarantees, but we can certainly put goals on projects and make sure that we attract those populations that we're trying to serve better. So with that, I'll move the item. Is there a set? Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion carries. Was there one more item, or is that it? Okay, if that's it, then we're on to the regular counter right. A few more speakers, or? <coughs> All right. We're now on 55A. And uh, go ahead, Aya and Robert. Well, they've gone. Yes. All right. So I called them out. No, 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 no. They're they're gone. They've already spoken twice. I'm sure they could speak more. Uh, so with that, um, any uh, uh, thoughts or questions on item 55A? Yes, Mr. Mayor. I would like to um, see if we can um, segregate both matters because there's some um, on one of them I am supportive and the other I am not. All right, so look, let me separate out the vote. Why don't we take uh, first uh, the item on uh, the city clerk. I entertain a motion. Is there a second? Second. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries unanimously. Now there's two separate items on the city attorney. <coughs> Why don't we take the, the bonus first? So let's entertain a motion on that. Motion to approve. Second. Those in favor, please say, say aye. 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 Who are we voting aye. on? The, the city the manager. Manager, okay. So, so, sorry. Verify. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? No. I'm a no. And Councilor Martinez is a no. <laughs> now there's the other item on 55A, and that's the item which is the contract uh, extension. And uh, are there any questions or thoughts on that? I'll move them. I'll second. We have a motion and second. Let's discuss the motion. Councilor Mayor, Martinez. Uh, of course, I am uh, a no vote. And you know, I just wanted to um, just state for the record why I'm a no vote. Um, I believe that the process that was taken was one that was not thoughtful and did not include the entire city council. Um, and so today, for the first time, I received the information from our city attorney that information was privy to the rest of the city council. Um, that's uh, one. Number two, um, the, the way that this process took place um, in closed session, and the, uh, maybe there was a, a, a good intent, but there was not a clerk or a city attorney while we were deliberating and we took action um, that for the city attorney to come out here that was given really i asked today who um actually told her what that motion was that we took 
And I was told that the city manager gave that to her. Um, and that one other council member concurred of, of that. And so I personally believe that, one, the city attorney or the clerk of the council should have been in the, in the room when we were deliberating and actually taking a vote so that the city attorney can do her job and come out here. She had to hear it from a second party that the contract really was in, in particular or the, uh, was for him. And so I believe, one, that process was not one that should have took place. Number two, I also believe that at this moment in time that we're extending this contract that when we went through this process, we appointed three people and the intent was not to come directly to this city council for a vote. My understanding was that you were going to go and work with the city attorney to, ne to negotiate with the city manager and come back with some options. Today, that's not before us. Today, you're asking us to take action when today is the first day that I received an email from the city attorney about what del deliberations took, pro uh, took place with the city manager's contract. Look, you... The majority is in favor of extending that contract, and I don't dispute that, and I'm not going to argue that. What upsets me is that I was not privy to the information. I am a count I'm a council on, I'm, I, I'm a, I represent the city council. I deserve the same information that all of you are receiving. And to receive it today of that you all choose to decide <laughs> to put this on the contract, and why is there such a rush? His contract doesn't, expire to next year of October. So why did we push this through so quickly, knowing that we have matters at hand that were serious and we had to do this without informing the rest of the council, whether we're supportive or not, we still should follow a process. And so I'm very disappointed that we tend to stick to certain processes and then other times we choose not to. And so it's uh, very unfair, not only to the council members that sit up here that were not privy to the information, but to the public of how this was dealt with. Uh, because it looks very negative on us. What, what we, one person does as a city council is a reflection of everyone on this city council. And we all know what Bell experience. When you do things behind closed doors with city managers and city managers making decisions of what their contracts should be without making deliberations in public is wrong. And, you know, it, it's, and it's wrong for you all to make those decisions and not including the entire city council, whether we're supportive or not. And so I just want to just share that and, and my reasons for voting no. Thank you. Uh, are there any other comments, Mayor Pro Tem? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sure. Um, well, I thought you wanted to speak. I saw. If not, I'll go to Councilman Reyna. No, no, no. That's fine. I think that um, you know, my comments are, are going to be brief, and so I agree with the councilwoman. If she received the information today, I think that that's uh, not sufficient time. I think that. Um, Everybody had an opportunity to see what the RFCA said. The language was there. It was circulated according to the Brown Act, uh, you know, last Friday, uh, from what I understand. Um, I don't want to disclose what happened in closed session because I don't want to violate the Brown Act there either. Um, so um, what I do recall was that there was um, some direction given that an ad hoc committee be formed so we can discuss with the city attorney steps to be recommended to the, to, the, to the larger city council and to be brought back here. Um, nothing was, no decision could be made by three council members whether we wanted to or not. We simply wanted to propose recommended action and the, the council was to consider it, um, adopt or not adopt, amend if they chose. So it was simply based upon that premise that the ad hoc was formed. And, um, and so I don't think there was anything, um, you know, anything wrong with that. We've done that before. We've had ad hocs form before. The ad hoc committee makes a recommendation. It gets posed before the city council. The city council either adopts or, again, or, or, or votes it down. I guess what I'm concerned about is, um, you know, um, this, you know, I don't think procedurally this was flawed. I think, um, you know, the recommended, the recommended action 
is probably not to the uh, to the liking of some council members. That's fine. I mean, I think we you know we shouldn't all agree on on everything that's being proposed. We we just had an item that was proposed by staff that was that was not adopted. That's what we're supposed to do. That's the whole process. That's the premise of our of our deliberative process. So, what makes it what's, what's interesting is that a lot of folks who are very um, um, not you know who aren't supportive of these uh, of the actions that we're going to be taking for the city clerk and the city manager at least those that are recommended um, you know I think that um, you know we all have to look back and see you know can we make our process better we can and I think um, you know in the future uh, what we want to do with all our staff with the city attorney as well as the city clerk as well as the city manager is have better um, better criteria to judge performance and I think that's something that I do agree with. But it's interesting that the council member that isn't supporting this um, really has been, you know, has had many issues addressed uh, by the by the uh, city manager and his staff. And it's interesting because if we were to do uh, a cost benefit and what funds were dedicated to those priorities uh, of certain council members and others, we'd see that they're very heavily loaded on one end. We've got a lot of good things that have done, and, and I'm not saying they're bad ideas, but I think we've got we've made a lot of progress on streets, on you know technology, on um, transportation. All those things are good things, but um, you know to say you know you're going to not support um, a, a performance um, bonus for somebody who has met your expectations, that's just uh, that just doesn't seem. Uh, that's counterintuitive to me because if those issues that you've been advocating for are being addressed and you're still not satisfied, then I just don't understand the measure of what criteria we could use that would be objective. So that's my, um, you know, that's my confusion here. But I get it. Sometimes you know we just don't agree with the whole premise of uh, of making you know certain decisions and 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 you know moving forward on an item on principle. But I just think that on balance. I tried to look at the criteria of both the city clerk as I did when the city attorney came before us and looked at what their performance was. And I tried to judge the city manager based on that same criteria. Because if we were flawed in not having a specific criteria for the city manager, we didn't have any criteria for the city attorney or the city clerk as well. And they were both granted performance bonuses. So why are we going to be selective on you know one or the other? I think we have to be I think everybody has to be judged on a on, on a similar criteria. So I think we you know we can do a much better job. I think we all should do that. But if if we're going to withhold now, we should have withheld on others as well. So um, I am going to be supportive of the. I think there's a motion and a second right on the on the floor. There, there is. So there's more discussion. and there's more discussion. But I just wanted to you know lay my reasons and my rationale for that. And if there's more discussion, I'm happy to opine. Um. Go ahead. You want to I just Go want ahead. to add on one more point. Um, I do want to say that during the ad hoc, when we were t discussing this matter, I think we do need, we did reach a consensus where we do need to have better criteria for performance evaluation. So I think that's one thing that if our city attorney can help us with, or I mean, not even just wording it, um, and work with our city manager to establish some goals that he wants to accomplish so that we can, next time we have your evaluation, we can work together and see where, what, what has been met, what needs to be met, and what we want you to work on, what you think and you see as a need for the city as well. So. Mayor, uh, member of the city council, absolutely uh, very interested in that process and would like to establish the goals and make sure everybody agrees to them. Thank you. Councilmember Raina, please. <clears throat> absolutely. You know, I know I've said this a few times, and, and when, when me and my colleague to my left joined this council, you know, all we heard was, was gloom and doom, and that we were on the verge of bankruptcy. And if you look around, some of our neighboring cities are still on the verge of bankruptcy. I think the quality of leadership that we have in our city manager is absolutely phenomenal, and that our city is lucky to have someone at this caliber. He came at the first time, as, as the first year, looking for a bonus, and there was a line of people out the store that did not agree with it. Today, we don't see residents out here today talking one way or the other because they can see the quality of the work that he's doing. I think that the process that we went through was fine. I didn't have a problem with that. We could always improve it, absolutely. Do we frequently make ad hoc committees? Absolutely. Does all the council members are privy to that information? No, because at, at first, no, because it's the Brown Act. 
That's the reason that you have only so many people sitting on that, that ad hoc. And they come in and they give information to the rest of the committee, and the committee takes a look at it as a whole, and then they decide what it goes to. So I don't have a problem with the direction that we're going into. Uh, I, I, I agree with a lot of the comments that uh, Mayor Pro Tem has made uh, regarding the processes that we've followed in the past for other programs and funding these processes. Uh, but, but what other investment that we can make into our community than our, our, our leadership? And, and you can see the quality of it. More people are coming into Santa Ana. More people are happy about the direction our city is going in. More development is taking place. We have nearly 30,000 businesses licensed. It didn't happen overnight. And it didn't happen before. It happened because of the decisions that this council made and hiring the quality people that we have. And rightfully so, they should be given a bonus for, the, for their criteria or for the work that they've done. And we should develop some criteria as we move forward. So I'm happy to endorse this. Absolutely. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, the only thing I wanted to uh, add and clarify is, is that there was a process, uh, whether it was something that was uh, formally documented uh, or not, I think is, is the other, uh, is, is the, the, the difference maybe as to whether one would think that there was a, a process or not. But uh, there definitely is uh, very detailed uh, there are very detailed uh, results. It's a uh, uh, performance, a merit-based uh, bonus that we're considering here tonight. Uh, we have had discussions uh, from the time that city manager uh, came to the city a few years ago. There were goals that were set out. Uh, we have had uh, annually discussions on updates on those those goals. We were able to, uh, it, it's, it's measurable, uh, the, the results that were, uh, that are being produced. And therefore, the majority of the council did uh, decide that there was merit there, as well as with some of the other uh, uh, leads and, and department heads in the uh, uh, in the city. So there, there was process. That it, it was clear. Could we tighten it up and, and have it be formalized? Uh, sure. Uh, and I think we, we should do that. Uh, but I just I definitely don't want the public to think that that it, that it was arbitrary and that it, it was uh, something that wasn't thought through, uh, discussed. Uh, and analyzed uh, uh, by, by members of the council who voted in support of that. So just wanted to clarify that. Uh, uh, just just one that. other clarification before we go to Council Member Mesklin. That is, uh, right now we're talking about the extension of the contract, not the bonus. We already voted 5-2 on the bonus. Yeah. Please I, go ahead. I, I think we were just mentioning, too, with uh, Council Member Roman here to my right, that uh, for the public, just so that for clarification, a lot of people were thinking, you know, it's a raise. It's not a raise. It's a per performance-based uh, bonus. And as far as the contract extension goes, I think uh, what better message to send out that we have stability. We're, we're extending his contract. We're looking at more stability for years to come. So hopefully, um, you know, our city's going to accomplish a lot of great things in the future, and uh, we hope to continue working with you. Thank you. Councilor Martin, I had on then I have, I have some questions. Please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, in 2006, when we came in, one of the things that we complained about as council members was that we felt as if we were being waited out, that we were being given little crumbs. Here you go. You know, let's keep you happy with. Oh, you want a little, you want a little tree by this, you know, park? We'll we'll plant the tree. But in the meantime, there was a staff in place that was handling business, and sometimes we wouldn't get we wouldn't get any information. It was just wait, wait when did this get signed? Did we take action on this? And so what we did as a council is we said, you know what, let's take it to the voters and see if we can get a term extension to get one more term on the council. And when that happened, they couldn't wait us out anymore. And that's when we were able to make change. And we were able to start moving things around because the city, this ship, was sinking. And it was sinking fast. And I mean, there was one time where I remember uh, a reporter called me and said, hey, uh, I hear that in your... Uh, in your banking statement, you guys only have about a million dollars in your reserves, and you may not have enough money to make payroll. These were the kind of things that we issues that we were dealing with, and we had meeting after meeting after meeting. I think we met every week, and it was very evident to us that it wasn't just a, we we we, didn't, we couldn't just plug up the holes. We need to we needed to bring a whole structural change to the city. And I don't know if you guys remember, do you remember the days when this was jam-packed because some people were politicizing this and they didn't want us to change the direction that we were moving in? And what a difference two, three years makes. 
Now, some will come up here and say, well, it was the decisions that we made. Yeah, the decisions that we made was to bring in a new city manager. And because we have a new city manager, look at all the staff that's here now that's come from as far as Glendale and other cities because they want to work with, the, with this individual because they know the caliber and, and, and the reputation that he brings. You know, I don't get it. I don't get when we were in such bad shape when we had this rickety boat that was sinking with so many holes and we were all trying to hold our hands to plug these holes up and someone came in and says, you know what, I got, I got some silly putty that'll fix this. Just temporary, let me put this on. And then they, they, when, once the, all the holes were filled, that captain came over and said, by the way, guys, uh, I just want to let you know, I'm bringing in this brand new ship. We're never going to have to worry about this again. And we all looked at him, and when he told us we were going to have a surplus, do you remember that, $10 million surplus? And I looked at him, and I said, you must be crazy. I said, there's no way. He says, Sal, I think it's going to be more. But I don't, want to, I don't want to overshoot. I think there's going to be more. And there was more. And then it was criticized. Oh, no, he's hiding, changing the numbers. It's fuzzy math. No, it was reaffirmed right after that. And in fact, our reserve was, our, 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 uh, our gains were even higher than expected the second year. So here's, here's my thing. If you have a coach who's bringing you winning championship seasons, why aren't you going to reward that coach? with an extension to the contract. Do you know that there's people out there that want this individual to go work at their city? We're just too good. We can't afford to do that. We have staff members that we couldn't afford before. We can afford them now. I look at Julie, my goodness, what a godsend. Because there's issues that community members have and I, I can call her right now. She's working on it throughout the day and we're working on it in the afternoon when I get out of my job. We didn't have that before. But we have that now because we are stable. Not just stable, we are doing very well to the point where professional teams are looking to see if this is the place they want to have their headquarters. Ladies and gentlemen, I've lived here my whole life. And I've always, and, and some people will say, oh, no, I've never had to make an excuse for living in Santa Ana. Well, good for you. You know what? Because I had to. There were people that would ask me constantly, why do you live there? Why did you stay? People that I graduated high school with that live in other cities, why are you still in Santa Ana? Because I love this city. And I believe that one day we could have the kind of day that we're having today. A day where people say, oh, you live in Santa Ana? I love it there. I go there every weekend. I like the you know, Robin's Nest, or I like this place, or I like that place. Oh, I love what you guys have done with the arts. I love what you guys have done with the downtown. I've loved, look at the schools now. They're all refurbished. And we're, we're starting to work and, and start to, we're starting to refurbish other facilities in our city. Why? Because for the first time in my lifetime, people are excited to come to my city and people are saying positive things about my city. I can't tell you how many times people congratulated me last week for just the possibility, just the possibility of having a professional team like the San Diego Chargers come to our city. Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen when you have bad leaders. That happens when you have strong, solid folks in those positions. And what I've really enjoyed is, is that uh, we can look at citizens and actually say, yeah, we can do that project because we have the money to do it. And um, I know I've kind of rambled off a little bit, but it just, to me, it's, it's, it's we want to keep the city manager here. We want to extend that contract to continue to flourish and do the job that, that the city is doing. So. Okay, and now, if I may, I, I have a few... Um, questions I'd like to ask. First, I want to go back to the process or lack thereof that Councilor Martinez uh, referenced earlier. And I'm not going to go into what happened, but I want to go into what didn't happen in closed session. Um, and I believe there was no official vote taken as it relates to the contract. I think that was more of a discussion. So I want to ask the city clerk who runs the minutes, is there anything in the minutes from the prior meeting that would reflect anything about this contract extension or any committee to discuss that? Not to my recollection. I did go back to the audio tape um, to listen to that portion of the meeting and the only thing recorded reported was the performance bonus. 
Only the performance bonus, and that was reported out as a 5-2 vote. Yes, that's correct. Nothing on the record about the latter. Exactly. Okay. Now I want to ask the city attorney, um, did you report anything out to the general public as it relates to um, the, the uh, contract uh, discussion? I reported out what I understood was legally required to be reported out. So did you report anything out on the ad hoc committee or the contract? Nope. So you didn't report that out. Okay, let me now uh, go to the next uh, step, and that is that Mayor Pro Tem, and I respect him, um, said that, you know, this was an opportunity for us to, uh, you know, consider amendments, et cetera, et cetera, do our, our contribution, because as Councilman Martinez says, some of us have completely been, you know, kept out on the cold on this. You know, we didn't see anything. All of a sudden, there's a recommended action. It's all been discussed. It's all been written. It's all on paper. Um, it's, it's ready just to be adopted. And so that being the case, what I would like to ask the city uh, attorney is if I were, were to request uh, a substitute motion that would have additional language would this be the appropriate uh, time to make that substitute motion? So there's a motion on the floor, but what I want to do now, therefore, is make a substitute motion. And yes. what I want to, you to do is, uh, can you read language, because I want the motion to be clear so people aren't confused, um, that would seek to amend the proposed contract extension um, in such fashion that there would be some language added that would make it uh, illegal for any romantic relationship uh, to, uh, to uh, exist uh, between the city manager and, and any employee here in the city. Do you have language for that, Madam City Attorney? Um, those types of clauses are no, as known as morality clauses. Um, if the council so desired and instructed me to um, draft that, I could. We'd, have, we'd need to propose that to the employee. Um, and ask the employee if that language is acceptable to the employee as well because it is an agreement and so two parties have to agree to it <coughs> so yes. if i want to make substitute motion that we give direction to do that is there a second i'll second the motion all right can we have discussion we can have discussion then we'll take a vote sure so go uh, ahead i actually like to make a substitute motion there's already a motion on the we can go three can we can go three right at once every, have, every committee, you know, every on committee I see it is a little bit different. Yeah, um, um, we don't. Your rules, your rules of decorum, say that you will loosely follow the parliamentary procedure. What our local process, as I've done this for about four years now, has been that we take one substitute motion and then we, we vote, vote on, on it. That. If, that loses, if that doesn't qualify, we can go back to the original unless another substitute motion is made. Can we? Can we? Let's do this. Why don't we vote on that? Let's call the vote. Let's vote on yeah. that. Yeah. So let's vote on the substitute motion. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? No. no. So motion fails. Now let's go back to the original motion. Is, uh, those in favor of the original motion, please For say the aye. Aye. Extension. Aye. 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 Those opposed? No. No. So it, the original motion passes 5-2, and the motion to add the, the clause on morality failed 5-2. So with that, now we go back to the next uh, scheduled item, Madam Clerk, which I believe is item 75A. So this is time and place for a public hearing on final environmental impact report 2015-01, amendment application 2014-04, general plan amendment 2015-03, development agreement 2015-03, investing tentative map uh, 2015 as well. For the Heritage Mixed Use Development Project proposed at uh, 2001 East Dyer Road, uh, it's the uh, Dyer 18 is the applicant. And uh, I know we have a staff presentation. And so let me go with that. Then I know we have some speakers. Please go ahead. I'll Thank you very much, Mr. Hand. Mayor, uh, members of the City Council. Uh, I'm going to start the presentation, and uh, Vince Fergoso here is going to get into the technical details in a, in a minute. Um, 
This is a proposal to construct a mixed-use development uh, consisting of 1,221 apartments, 18,000 square feet of commercial space, and 56,000 square feet of off uh, office space. Uh, the entitlements in front of you today for uh, approval are one, number one, certification of a final environmental impact report, a general plan amendment, a zone change, a development agreement, and a vesting map. Uh, I'm just going to highlight a few of the benefits of this project before uh, Mr. Fragoso gives into the details of the, the proposal. This project uh, will first, uh, firstly uh, reoccupy a long-term vacant structure that has been sitting there for uh, approximately 14 years and not be used. It'll be bringing back that structure into use and reoccupy it. It, will, uh, it has a very strong urban design and architecture with lead uh, silver certification uh, proposal to follow. And approximately 275 new permanent jobs are to be created as a result of this particular project. Uh, and uh, based on our more conservative estimates than I think the developers' estimates, based on our more conservative estimates, the general fund revenue of approximately $1 million per year will be added to the general fund as a result of this project. And then uh, we would, did not want to leave out the public art contribution of approximately $1.5 million dollars that will be staggered, is, uh, scattered all, all around the project. <clears throat> And also, uh, in addition to that, there's a contribution of uh, nearly $10 million for affordable housing in the form of in lieu fees. Uh, uh, these are some of the benefits, and Mr. Fergoso is going to get into details. Thanks, Hassan. Good evening, City Council members. I'll go over kind of briefly this, kind of the, the details and nitty-gritty of the project. This is an aerial map of the, of the project site, 18 and a half acres, almost 19 acre site. As you can see there in the center in red, it's pretty much in the area, it's a mixture of industrial and office, and you've got the city of, cities of Tustin and Irvine to, to the right. Here's the uh, site plan for the project. In red is the mixed-use component of the project. Five uh, level uh, units, 1,200 units for the project. And the center part there in blue is a 56,000 square foot office building that's going to be carved out from the existing building. It's a, considered a wrap project. As you can see, the units wrap around the three parking structures, which is one structure for each of the units, or the buildings, excuse me. As far as the floor plans, 17 floor plans, anywhere from studios to three bedroom units, you're looking at 600 square feet up to 1,400 and larger square feet per unit. Here's a landscape open space plan. Uh, this is a, a variety of pathways and trails for the project site. In the center there is a, a little over an acre. It's called a central park. Uh, that's going to be put in, in the first phase. They've also got some courtyards, as you can see, mixed into the project itself. There's a minimum of two courtyards per project. Then you've also got some indoor spaces as well as some rooftop amenity decks. So it'll be highly amenitized with some open spaces. <clears throat> Part of the actions that uh, Hassan mentioned a few minutes ago you need to uh, uh, vote on tonight is the EIR. EIR was prepared for this project. It was out for release, public comments. We received only eight comments. Uh, what the EIR found out is, during this analysis of the environmental impacts was that there's some uh, non-mitigated impacts that to deal with air quality and, and traffic. And so you have to adopt a statement of overriding considerations uh, to override those, uh, those impacts. Got a development agreement before you this, this evening here. Some of the key provisions, six-year agreement with a three-year extension if the developer complies with certain benchmarks. Uh, they're going to phase the project. Then as Hassan mentioned, you've got the public art contribution, which is in there, housing opportunity ordinance contribution, and then we're requiring that the most of the common open space be built in the first phase so that early uh, tenants can enjoy the open spaces. It's also got a vesting map to subdivide it off into six parcels, uh, four development parcels, two open space parcels. Um, again, it's not a condominium project, it's an apartment project. So we're going to be having part of this approval of some CCNRs for common area maintenance, uh, access egress, and other types of uh, similar items. The project is zoned industrial, as well as the general plan uh, land use designation of industrial. So part of your access tonight is to rezone the property from industrial to a specific development, as well as change the general plan so the zoning and general plan are consistent to a district center, which is what you find in uh, the downtown up by the main place mall and down by the south coast area there. Um, within your packet, you have the zoning standards. The SD standards are in your packet. Uh, this project complies with the standards. It's been designed to be a, a really quality uh, project. 
Uh, that last bullet point is going to, you've probably all seen the, envis the visioning map that we have that's been presented before you. This whole area is looked to be part of a mixed use development uh, within the city. So this project is going to be consistent with what we see as a vision for this area. Uh, quickly, your planning commission, they reviewed the project and, and recommended unanimously to approve all the actions before you. Because it required a general plan amendment, this project had to go before the Airport Land Use Commission. They had a meeting in mid-October and voted to find a project inconsistent with their land use plan. So what does that mean? This body has to overrule their determination. And you have to vote by two-thirds vote to overrule their determination on the project. Uh, what essentially means is that the liability shifts from the airport to the city for any future types of activities or incidences by the airport. So you have findings in your packet there. Example, what kind of incident you might uh, it could be a noise incident. Could be anything from fuel drop, um, any type of any type of accident, basically anything. And when you say we're liable, what is that? Mean? Well, right now the airport itself is liable for any type of incident that happens. So it shifts. We're overruling their decision. They said it's inconsistent. So now it shifts over to us. We have a, a, a our expert here, Dr. Lickman. She's uh, did the, the findings that are in your packet. She can also answer more technical questions if you have anything in there that you have any uh, inquiries on. And then before you, Hassan mentioned all the benefits of the project, uh, our recommendation is that this body approve the actions from before you this evening. As I mentioned a few moments ago, we have a whole team of, of uh, EAR consultants, our Airport Land Security Consultant. The development team is here, uh, staff is here to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you um, for that. Do we, uh, I see that there's um, two requests to speak that are just uh, for folks that are available upon request. And I think uh, there's one request to speak by Ms. Cepetto. Do you uh, want to address the uh, council, Ms. Cepetto? The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor Pro Tem, Sarmiento, and members of the City Council. We want to uh, thank you for having the opportunity to bring our project to you this evening. Uh, first of all, we'd like to thank the staff for their hard work. Uh, we've been working with them over the past three years to define and shape a project that brings considerable public benefit to the city and also uh, will act as a, uh, a significant economic uh, uh, injection into that area of town and uh, creating jobs. And I think that um, the staff has done a great job in making a presentation to you tonight. So we are really here just to answer any questions. Our team is here. If you have any questions of us, we'd be pleased to respond. Thank you. Seeing no other members of the public, I'm going to ask the city clerk if we received any uh, written communications that, uh, that have been distributed to the council. We have not. Okay. All the ones that uh, you did, that we did receive yes, have been they've circulated. been entered into the record. Okay. Yes. And so those are from the, uh, can, you, can you recite the uh, written communications that we've received? Um, we received a letter of support from the Orange County Business Council, from the Kennedy Commission, and the Orange County Business. Let me see, I'm sorry. The Orange County the Business BIA, Council. The building industry. So the BIA, the Kennedy Commission, the Orange County <laughs> Business Council. Yes. And there were all letters in support. Yes. Of both the the underlying project and the companion project. Absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so I'll go ahead and bring it back to council. If there's any questions or comments. I'll make Councilman. a motion to approve. So I was going to make the motion approve, but I'll second it now. I we have a motion and a second. And comment comment may, may by Councilman. I'm sorry, Mayor Bertram. Just as a matter of process, because um, it is a land use approval, I, I would like to ask, there was a list up there of all the approvals in order, but I would like to ask, rather than taking one motion, can we just have an action separately on the environmental document? It's very important okay. for purposes of CEQA that the Council actually state that they've reviewed the document and that you're making an independent decision that you've read the document. So if I could get you to enter that into the record, that will make our record much better. Do you want to just read it and I'll do so, Sonia? Well, I think the Council members have to just get on the record in their own words that Go ahead and just, just segregate out the, the uh, uh, environmental, the EIR, so we can vote on that separately, I think. Just separately. I, I would okay. prefer that All right. Let that. me segregate out the EIR as a separate uh, item. And, uh, and there's a resolution. Do we have a motion a second? Those in favor, please say aye. 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 aye those opposed? Six motion zero. carries unanimously. And now, can we go to the balance of the items? Yes, and that would be items B, it's resolution, um, and then there's 2AB as well. So I would enter, is that motion already on the floor? No. 
All right, I will entertain that motion. So moved. Second. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. No, just go ahead. For clarification, yeah, for thank you, Mr. Mayor. And um, I know that there was an item seven on the recommended action that I'm looking at um, to consider uh, making sure that we go back to the development agreement and amend to include the in lieu language that was recommended by the Planning Commission and recommended by the developer as well. Should that, that be a right? separate motion? Yes, if you'd like to give me direction to um, draft that language and negotiate with the property owner, I'd be happy to do that and work with staff. Why don't you make the motion? I'll move the item. Is there a second on that motion? Second. Those in favor, please. Aye. Aye. Question. Okay. Go ahead. So um, as we start talking about, and I'm not sure what staff I'm going to be looking at, uh, as we start talking about in lieu fees and whether we're going to build affordable housing uh, sites on site or off site, part of the recommendation looks like we're going to partner up with one specific entity and, and, and all the in lieu fees are going to go specifically to that entity. Am I understanding that correct? That was uh, that is what is being presented in this case. The planning commission made it made that recommendation, and I, actually, I must say that I went on the record and I told the planning commission that the planning commission had not seen the project to which they were recommending this money to go to, and um, that, that was not that the ordinance, the housing opportunity ordinance. Uh, provides an opportunity for the developer to express a preference. It does not uh, obligate the city council or any other body for that matter to actually take that preference. So if we go with the recommendation right now, we're literally looking at earmarking $10 million to one particular... What we presented to you does not... Re not the recommendation, uh, the uh, option number seven is not in, the, in any of the drafted documents in front of you. Option number seven is if you want to go with the Planning Commission recommendation, that will be another additional action that then you will direct that staff to take action on for you, to pre pre prepare that language for your uh, consideration in the future. And, and I'm sorry, Sonia, the, the recommendation right now that's been uh, uh, motioned and second is to approve that's, that seventh option? No. Or can we so what that you too? have approved before you is the development agreement that staff negotiated with the property owner, okay? Um, at the planning commission meeting, the planning commissioners wanted to add to that development agreement this requirement that any funds received by the city be dedicated to this particular project. That was a recommendation from the planning commission. That was not part of the staff recommendation. We felt like we needed direction from the council because the in lieu ordinance that this council adopted allows the um, person who's going to make the payment of the in lieu fee to express a preference. Um, and then the, we have uh, we've been working with staff to come up with a process in which that preference could then be implemented. And so there's been a various there's been like a two or three step process. So what we thought we would do is communicate to you the recommendation of the planning commission. And if you decide as the council, yes, we want to do what the planning commission wanted us to do, then I will go back and work with staff to see how we can implement that get all those details in it. If you decide that you don't want to take the Planning Commission recommendation, then the development agreement will be approved tonight in that, very, that previous motion that you just took. The, 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 the potential of number seven that we're moving forward, are, is there precedent, is there another city that has done something like that? There are other cities, I, I'd, I'd let our, our um, director speak better to it. There are other cities who have these in lieu ordinances that allow the direction of fees to particular <laughs> projects. Um, I think what's just different in these cases is that most of the time that occurs when the money is actually received by the city. Once the city has the money in its hands, there is a process by which the person who paid the money can then come forward and make a request. But I think we looked, staff looked at some other ordinances. I, I was not no, personally uh, familiar with that. It's actually, it's, it is not impossible to do, but it's quite uh, uncommon. In fact, what's most common in practice is that the in lieu fee ordinance, uh, in lieu fee is directed towards an account uh, by the housing authority and the housing authority typically then uses that money like any other resource and then proceeds with uh, directing that resource any way they like. It may be a sole source or it may be a, an RFP process, but it's usually directed to the housing authority and the housing authority with, the, with uh, consultation with the city council usually makes decisions. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, Mayor Pro Tem? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we both, we have the developer here we have the uh, representative, well, and I think, Mr. City Manager, did you want to make a comment? I saw you nodding your head. Uh. Just a point of emphasis in this case, uh, we believe the developer expressed his desire to uh, recommend funding for the project, and also the Planning Commission, the staff presented as an option, 
and it's uh, at the discretion of the city council. Okay. And just, um, you know, if the developer, I guess both developers can come forward and, and, and address the council on some questions that um, uh, we may have. I guess what I'm concerned about is the precedence that's being set. Um, this isn't a novel thing, uh, Mr. Director. I know that I, I've seen other cities that have in-lieu ordinances, and they sole source. They allow the developer to direct those funds where they choose. We, if anything, what we did, we amended our in-lieu ordinance, um, our housing opportunity ordinance, to allow for a dual uh, process. In the event that a developer wants to direct his funds towards a project that they see is going to be a sound project, something that is uh, worthy of those in-lieu fees, he or she can direct them there. In the event that the developer has no preference, those funds get procured, and those funds go out to bid. So that's what we did in amending our ordinance, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. I believe that's the history of the ordinance, correct? Yes, uh, Mayor, uh, members of council. The city council has the ultimate authority to direct the funds. In this case, as we mentioned, both the developers and the uh, planning commission. So we present this option, but it's, uh, it's up to your discretion. And so, uh, uh, Ryan, uh, Mr. Ogulnik, if you want to address the council and let us know for the record what your preference is and why you want to have these funds directed uh, in the manner that you've so said. I believe there was some written correspondence that was received by the um, city staff on this. Th thank you, Councilman uh, Sarmiento. Yes, we sent a correspondence to the city 60 days ago detailing our preference for the funds to go to AMCAL. Primarily, uh, we've done due diligence on AMCAL. We visited at least three of their sites. Uh, they're remarkably similar to market rate units. Uh, it was explained to us by AMCAL staff that y you have school teachers, in some case you have uh, just dis disadvantaged people in general that are able to pay $150, $200 a month for units that we would charge two or 3000 uh, We had not seen units of this quality uh, in this low income segment. So to us, it was a no-brainer. Right, and, and this project is, some, is, is going to be located on First Street between Grand and the Five Freeway, um, where there is a lot of crime activity. There are no residential developments. There's nothing but hotels that are underperforming. There's prostitution. There's illegal activity. There's just a very, very, it's a very sad place to be. Correct. And this would be one step in addition to what Lyon is doing right down the street in addition to what the Elks are going to do at the uh, old Saddleback Insight, what's going on at the old Ramada Inn Towers, uh, they're being uh, converted to um, uh, assisted living. And down the street, there's, a, there's a, uh, a, a, a hotel that's being converted to housing for veterans. And my understanding, if I'm not incorrect, this is going to be a goal-oriented project where it's going to be for, uh, for veterans as well. So I don't get it because I know I've seen plenty of information on this and I, I hope that um, you know we respect because what we're doing with your underlying project Mr. Ogulnik is we're converting light industrial to residential that's a big leap and I hope all of us understand the leap that we're taking here but we're doing it because it's a good project it's a good thing but we normally are not in the business of rezoning what little industrial we have for residential purposes, but we're doing it because we're taking a leap of faith in the vision that you've shown us and what you want to see there. And we believe that that's a good decision, that's a good public policy direction that we want to take, similar to the same decision that you made to support this, pro this companion project in an area that's underperforming, in an area that this council identified in the housing element. We all agreed to say, let's look at some areas that are underperforming in the city, let's put some housing there because families should be there. And that's what you did. You were conscious enough to say, this is a site here that's worthy of my funds that I'm going to be paying into the city. Mm -hmm. I think the only confusion is the Housing Opportunity Ordinance was passed only a short, the, the revision to it, and it, it's, the, it's the first project where developer A is allocating funds to develop. Understood. And maybe so, we hope it's going to be something that's commonplace, I sure. think, you know, in the future. When we do have market rate developments and there are there is a companion project that follows that market rate development, they can work together. This is exactly the way the process should work. 
And when, and when the developer doesn't have a process, then it goes out to bid. That makes perfect sense. And I know that was something that was deliberated here as well. So I, I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm a little confused because I almost see this as a two for one. You know, we're getting something that we know, look, is a leap, a leap of faith in converting these, these light industrial areas into residentials. And we're going to be helping an underperforming part of town that we've identified already. Right. in a way that's going to bring affordable units at 30 to 60 percent AMI for veterans. Uh, you know, I just don't understand, I guess, where the hiccup is. So I, I don't know that there is a hiccup. I think we agree. I just don't think staff has processed it before. And I'm, no. and, and I'm, I'm sorry to be uh, taking down on you. I'm just very uh, dumbfounded by staff. Okay. Because I just don't think that they presented this well. I don't think they deliberated this well. And I think that it was very, um, I think the RFC was just not drafted well. So I am very, very disappointed. Okay. If I can. Uh, Go ahead, Mr. Turner. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, Council Members. If I may add, the question was asked Has this happened before? Is it common practice? Orange County has 34 cities, six of those have inclusionary ordinances. All of those cities have done. What we're proposing tonight. It is common practice. I'm not sure where staff got in their information. If you look at Brea, if you look at Irvine, you look at Newport Beach, you look at San Clemente, you look at Huntington Beach, they've all done this. It's pretty common, no RFP. So we see a good thing here. I'm not sure where the confusion lies, but I just want to set that straight for the record. Um, let me make a comment, and I know there's other council members uh, that are comment. Look, I think this is a wonderful opportunity for us because Councilmember Samiento is right. That area along uh, East First Street, we want to bring investment to that area. And, and if we don't drive it this way, it's not going to come on its own. And the fact that other things are happening are great, but a solid project like the one you're talking about that we can direct into that part of town is going to make a huge difference. You know, already on Grand Avenue, we're trying to improve Grand Avenue and First. And as you go further east on First, there's some things happening on the other side of the freeway. But, you know, other than the hotel and what we're going to do with the Elks, you know, this is much needed. And the fact that, you know, you've done your work, you've done the proposal, I just don't see the downside here. And I understand that you know, everything's maybe not in perfect order today, but your intentions are. And I just would say that as we approve this today, we're going to continue to work with you to make that a reality. And I don't think anything's going to get in our way. Do you see a problem, Mr. City Manager, as it relates to what we're talking about? No. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we uh, uh, took uh, what the uh, Planning Commission said the desires of the developer, as the city attorney mentioned, as soon as we get your vote, we're ready to go to work and draft a development agreement. Thank you. More questions, or are we ready to vote? Uh, I do uh, have a Council Member Benavides. Question. question. Uh, one is I do want to, um, first of all, commend staff uh, for the couple of years of work on this, this specific uh, parcel over on the southeast uh, part of town, uh, an area that's been dormant. We see a lot of activity around cross street, just across the, the other uh, city, uh, city boundary, city lines. And uh, yet, for some reason, uh, these industrial uh, buildings have been sitting vacant for a long time. Uh, at times, it's been difficult, and in, in times past, uh, maybe with, with other uh, staff or uh, developers to be able to get uh, a positive response and, and to work um, very closely with uh, developers to bring some good significant projects for the city such as this one so uh, I commend uh, planning staff uh, for, for the work on this one and, and to uh, the developer uh, of the Heritage Village it's, it's, uh, as I look at the renderings I hope that it looks like what you've, you've submitted to us because that's, that's pretty exciting it's impressive the architecture uh, the design, and we, we've had an opportunity to talk about uh, this. You've taken a lot into consideration of what feedback uh, council has given on previous projects, uh, as well as uh, uh, deliberations and conversations around this project. It is uh, a unique uh, project, uh, proposing 1,221 apartments to 18,000 square feet of commercial, 56,000 square feet of, of office space, mixed use. Uh, it's, it's something that uh, I believe we're going to be able to be proud of as, as it's presented. And so I commend you uh, for, for that, for all the work, due diligence, response. 
Uh, MCAL has been uh, a very strong partner with uh, the city as well and has uh, provided uh, a project that I'm very proud of having kind of gone to bat uh, and we, we narrowly were able to, to get it uh, past Vista del Rio. I was very excited to be able to be there for the grand opening and, and seeing the, uh, 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 the vulnerable uh, community uh, members and families uh, that oftentimes don't have a, a dignified place to call home that are being able to be served uh, there through, through Vista del Rio and I've seen some of the projects and followed some of the other projects and uh, Mr. Turner uh, high respect for you and former uh, planning commissioner appointee of mine here on, on, uh, on this uh, uh, on this dais serving on the planning commission uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to to hearing more about the project and, and we, we are going to be chatting a little bit about that I, I do have uh, a question for for staff and or uh, as to where that the project is in the in the pipeline the the first street uh, project uh, I, I uh, am very interested to learn more about it the first street project has been submitted for planning review uh, it's uh, in the in the hands of a case planner and the case planner is actually working with the applicant on the design details at this moment it's still in process of review Okay. The Planning Commission has not yet seen no, it either? No, it hasn't gone to the Planning Commission yet. Okay. The, uh, a, a, as much as I'm, I'm very much, you know, I've been impressed by the, by the, uh, the work of AMCAL, uh, the, uh, I, I would be, I'm, I'm very interested in, in seeing, learning more about the project. Uh, the other question that I have too is, is the, earlier today, one of the actions that we took is to, uh, go to RFP on on 1.2 million dollars of affordable housing uh, dollars, a very limited pot of funds that we have. Uh, how much do we have as a, as a total? How much do we annually allocate towards? Uh, so Ms. Renders, perhaps you can uh, address. I'm just trying to get a full picture of just what our annual is, especially in light of the fact that we just uh, voted to go on RFP on, on 1.2, um, and we're talking about two million, ten million dollars. Uh, and I don't know if you know yet if there's been a formula yet submitted on the, the proposed first street project and whether we know how much, if, if all the full $10 million will be allocated for that project, will be a portion of, of what will be coming from the Heritage Village. Um, first of all, you know, our federal funds vary from year to year. Um, we have had, you know, several million dollars, you know, available depending on um, what we get from HUD. In addition, we are starting to collect you know we had some collection of in lieu fees we anticipate some additional collection of in lieu fees so once we get to where we have a sufficient amount for a project you know probably in the four to five million dollar range then we would typically go out for an rfp much how we handled the meta project on a, on an annual basis do you know roughly how much it's we're it's hard to know it, because it, I, I can never guarantee when we'll get an in lieu fee check from a yeah. developer as far as fe federal allocation? Um, uh, I think our home funds are 1.6 for next year. CDBG, do you know Judson offhand? 500,000 for next year. So it's, and so we, we no longer have NSP funds, so. So really uh, the inclusionary funds really help to build that's, that that's pot of the, money. Uh, so it's, what I'm, what I'm, as much as I'm, I anticipate that it's going to be, that the pr proposed project is going to be a quite high, high quality project, as is the track record for, for the, the, uh, the developer of the first street project, uh, I, I'm just... So typically, to answer your other question, you know, you can look at actually the meta project that's in there as kind of their sources and uses of funds as far as the different funding sources that go into these projects. Typically, with close to $10 million, I would think that we would, could probably fund two, maybe three projects, depending on how competitive they are with tax credits and cap and trade funds. Yeah. Uh, so right now, the, the action that's on the table, uh, basically, I'm, I'm wondering if we can do some t something where it's preliminary I definitely see that having some of the respecting and what the that the uh, developer of Heritage Village is requesting I think ultimately it is at the discretion of, of council but I, I do think that it that there is merit to designate funds there uh, although I, I having the full you know nearly 10 million dollars go to one project specifically I'm, I'm just struggling with having with making that decision especially without having the project knowing the finances or the or the plans themselves so 
I think, Mr. Turner, you wanted to... If I can address that just briefly. We, we saw this kind of as a two-step process tonight where you'd consider the heritage, the request to recommend the in-lieu fees with, in, in concept. We would then submit an application to staff, be underwritten by your consultants. It would come back to city council with a specific dollar amount. I don't envision it being $10, $10 million. I envision a smaller amount. But typically, it's a two-step process where you... You approve a project and a companion off-site project, then we come back at a future date um, with a recommendation for funding. Whatever, whatever, whatever dollar amount that is that we agree to and work in concert with uh, city staff and their consultant. Okay. That, something like that, I, I, and you've, you mentioned there's six other cities. This is new for us and on, on the, uh, the new fees and the designation of the, uh, by, the, by the developer. Something like that, I, I think. Uh, so, so I still, Kelly, I, I think I still have questions either for you or Hassan. I'm not sure exactly how we can word this, or might be city attorney can I address think, it. I think one of the things is that, you know, the council makes kind of a broad policy decision, and then you give us direction, and we can work to iron out the details. In my opinion, if you gave us the direction that the planning commission requested, I think that was the city manager's recommendation this, this evening, that if you wanted to go in this direction, then we would come back with an amendment to the development agreement. We'd actually amend the existing development agreement because if that's where, you know, that's where you want to put it. But one of the things we have to work out is we can't, even if, if the development agreement says we're going to direct the money in this particular way, we have to make sure we actually receive the money. So we have to make sure that we protect ourselves and we protect the city because if the developer doesn't pay the money until the, when they pull their building permits, we don't want to have a commitment to someone else to pay them $10 million that we haven't yet received. So there's a lot of the details I think that we've got to work out. It's really easy to say we're going to give someone the money, but we've got to really work out the details. So I think the option seven was if you guys felt that was a good direction to move in, let us know, and then we'll go work out some details and we'll come back and make proposals to you. How can you word it so that what the, the, the reference that was just made uh, is, is followed where at the, where it basically comes back so that we can look at the project, project being underwritten, and, and find out what that dollar figure is going to be. I can so address that. I mean, we do a subsidy layering analysis, you know, when we evaluate these projects to determine whether the subsidy level that the developer is asking for is appropriate. Um, you know, we definitely want to have those checks and balances. The federal government looks for those checks and balances from us as well. So, so there is that analysis. Um, I, I don't know... Um, is, is there, is when there, I would be doing that analysis uh, if I don't have um, funds to commit for a loan. Okay, so... It's city attorney was mentioning. So, so the, the question still, ultimately, how do we address whether we're going to, at this point, I'm, I'm not clear as to whether we're with the action on the floor, whether we're saying all $10 million is going to go to one project, or we are committing funds to a, right. to a project and developers so can come back. Can, can you keep the floor for a moment? Option to consider. But let me just have him keep the floor, but I just wanted Mayor Pro Tem make a comment because I think he had the uh, initial intent. Yeah, I just want to clarify what was in the staff report, though. I just want to make sure we all get back because I think we went away. The staff report, option number seven, was to consider modifying the proposed development agreement to direct the in lieu housing fees as recommended by the Planning Commission. That was the option that was in the staff report. Right, I think right. that's to what that's the point the city manager is referencing. Of course, you can do anything else. I just want to make sure that that's right, that's what it. the recommendation was from staff. Right, and I guess I guess that language to me incorporated what the council member's concern was, which is not it's not an adoption tonight. It's to give direction to staff so they could work with both the developer and the developer okay. of the companion project to work out timing, to work out. Um, you know, the application to make sure that it's agreeable to the council and it's going to be, uh, you know, what that figure is because, you know, yeah, people are, thro yeah, uh, right, people are throwing around the, $10 million. Right, because the developer doesn't and, want and, to adopt you know, that. What's that? I mean, we've got to work with the landowner because they have to, it's an agreement, right. so we have to make so, sure that they so all these, agree. So, you know, these things about, you know, it being, you know, $10 million being able to fund three different projects, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me because this isn't also unprecedented. Let's remember what we did for CNC development over in um, on um, uh, Townsend Rate, what we did with the um, what we did with the station district, how much funds we dedicated there, those were in the eight ten million dollar range. I remember that we approved that here from this council, and we can pull up the record to say, you know, those were dedications that were made. This and it wasn't 
unprecedented because we knew it was an important project for us to support. So to say now that you know we're, we're doing something that's novel, I get the fact that you know we um, we don't see this project and we'd like to see a more tangible effort. So I would suggest to you as we hopefully give direction to the city attorney to, to follow up on the um, option number seven or the uh, or, or the recommended item number seven. Mr. City Manager, could you lead this, please? Because I think that we're, I'm just confused by your directors, both in planning and community development, that this gets, you know, somehow sideways. Yes. So if yes, you uh, can lead this yes, and Mayor, figure this and, out uh, with the members developer. Members of the council, I work very close with the city attorney and, and lead the project. Uh, and we're asking for you to, uh, it sounds like you want to recommend that option with the comments that have been made and we would for have to, to negotiate. For, for yeah, if, if, it's, if it's, thank you, Mayor. If it's going to come back to the council and, and some of the other projects that Mayor Portem referenced, we did have the full project, we had the renderings, we had the financials. The Planning Commission recommendation, I'm reading it here from Planning Commission Action, the Planning Commission added a recommendation to direct the in lieu housing fees to a project proposed by Amkel on East First Street. The pro num item number seven says, option to consider modifying proposed development agreement to direct the in lieu housing fees as recommended by Planning Commission. So there, there, it's, it, so that's where I'm struggling is that the, the, the report from staff is that there's $10 million and there's reference of the in lieu fees being directed to one project. So that's where it's, it's just confusing for me if we're going to see the project, but I, I think I'm sure the project's going to be a quality project. I want to have funds go to, to this project. I just would like to have a little bit more background from staff so we can have that process, know how much we're dedicating before we, otherwise it's, it's pretty blind. Uh, you're well, to make a uh, Councilman and Mayor, what uh, we want is the direction that the fees are been directed to AMCAL, for lack of better words, and that we'll come back with the details and the amounts as part of the negotiation with the two landowners, and we'll bring that back to council. I just want to make it clear that if, if we do that, we, we have to have meetings of the minds all the way around because we make the recommendation. Because tonight, the action you took is you approved the development agreement. So just letting you know that. we, I'm reminiscing on a project that we approved almost four years ago where we did this at a meeting, and then we had all this confusion, and it cost a lot of people a lot of money and attorney's fees. So I just want to make sure that you understand that. You approved the development agreement tonight. You would be directing us to now go and discuss these changes to the development agreement with the landowner and, and, and to discuss that with staff as well. Just, I, I don't want anyone to be confused as to what you're directing us to do. Is a developer good with that? And I mean, what? Yeah, this, I'm William Devine, uh, attorney on behalf of the, the developer. The, the motion or the recommendation is to consider modifying the proposed development agreement. Um, I think that wording doesn't work for us because we're getting the development agreement approved tonight and that's a final action. Yeah, you don't want to we don't want to go modify it and come back again later with a development agreement. That doesn't make sense. But the direction in terms of working with city to come up with some kind of an agreement to direct the funds, that's that's fine. But we just don't, the, the current language says modifying the proposed development agreement, and that just doesn't work. What would you propose the language be? I think that the, uh, to consider, to, well, basically to work with the city staff to come up with a proposal to direct the in lieu funds to a specific project, and then we come back and ultimately get city approval for that. Do similar council to what members was, have a similar to what was problem stated. with that is the motion? Yeah. I think that would be better if we, I guess we would be adding a number eight, right? Well, we uh, just would delete, we'll seven, delete seven, seven and delete just seven include, and include the substitute language that you just right. mentioned. Exactly, exactly. Madam Clerk, did you get that language? I would have to go back to the tape, but I believe Can I have Can you say it again slowly and we'll, yeah, we'll, yeah, I'm we'll not, make I'm it. I'm not understanding that. Could, could, I'm sorry, could, could you repeat that? Okay. I, I want him to repeat the language that he's proposing. Okay. Basically, to remove item seven as written and to replace it with language that developer uh, or that you direct city staff to work with the developer to come up with language or an agreement to that effect that would direct our in lieu funds that we're already obligated to pay to a specific 
project, a, a specific affordable housing project. And so that's the motion, and we leave the development agreement alone. Exactly. All right, do I have a motion to that effect? Madam City Attorney, do we have a problem with that? No, that's, 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 if that's the direction. Um, Let's do it. A motion. All right, we have a motion. Is that acceptable to the companion developer on this? Yeah, no, we're, we're, we're open to it. I just wanted to add one thing. We had prepared a PowerPoint presentation tonight to share with you our proposal. We, can, we, we don't need to do that tonight. But, but, but we don't need it. It's not on the agenda. We're going to work I, with I, you, I think, I think what we wanted to communicate was that we've been working with, with the planning department since 2014 uh, for over we'll a year now. They, they've fully reviewed and commented on our designs. And we, we, have, we have pretty much a final approved site plan now. The other thing I wanted to add is that City Council did consider and did take action on this project, committing project-based Section 8. So it's been reviewed financially. It's well known by staff, both planning and community development. So we wanted to explain that tonight. I think you may, you may already know that, but we're fine coming back. Our goal is to work in partnership with the Heritage and help expedite a really high quality, affordable community on First Street where we feel there's a great need for that and for efforts to revitalize the area. Why don't you come back and make that as part of the presentation as we have these details worked out. City attorneys tell me this is not on the agenda for yeah, tonight. It's, it's not on it's not on the agenda. That project is not on the agenda for tonight and um, if the if the staff if the direction from the council is for us to go work that out then and I, we have I just a want motion. to make clarification is that agreement with the landowner that you're asking us to prepare? I, I, I just want to be clear. Isn't it for three, the three parties? I mean, isn't it the city, the landowner, and the developer? I mean, don't we have to incorporate all parties involved? I'm that's what I'm trying to figure and, out. And yeah. the last thing I would also say, give us a time certain. Uh, we don't want just some open-ended, you know, when can you bring this back to us? Um, well, I think I can do that pretty quickly. What, what I just... But I want to make sure that we're clear is that we don't have any money to dedicate to anyone right now. Yeah, but that's going to be addressed in the whole discussion yes, of, the, of the agreement. but if the project that's being discussed is far along in the pipeline as the as a developer is suggesting that it is, I just want to make sure that it, that, that developer understands that, they may, that their project may be ready to go before we've collected the money on the project that you've approved tonight. It's all, and so that, that may be a reality. I just want to make sure that we can't commit money we don't have in our hands. If we Johnny get money has in our hands, to work. exactly. And so yeah, I can draft a great agreement as long as you all understand. But just incorporate that time, that timing issue in that. I mean, you can say developer needs to fund it, or when the developer funds it, these monies are made available to the to the companion project. Correct. I mean, it's not that difficult. You know, I mean, I know that you know these are done all the time. That if 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 the developer doesn't fund for six months, twelve months. Those funds can't be dedicated to the Correct. companion project because there is no money. Correct. That's all. Right? That's yes. So you, I mean, you can yes, we can, you can draft as as around want, that. I just wanted you? to make sure that you understood that. Of course. That's I, mean, I that's, wanted the applicant for the project to understand that. Well, if there's if no we, money, uh, correct. Sonia, as long then as you understand that, that's absolutely clear. I can do that. Yes, that's very simple. Could come back fairly quickly with that agreement. All right. So now that we have everything straight, um, I have a motion and a second. And all this, by the way, is recorded in the minutes at the. Second. You don't have a second? You do now. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries unanimously. So with that, uh, Madam Clerk, what is our next item? We have a joint item, 80A. All right, joint item 80A. I will call, a, I will call us to order. Do I have uh, a motion? So moved. We have a second. Second. We have a second. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 aye those opposed, motion carries. I'm now going to direct our attention to the Housing Authority and request a motion for the recommended action. Motion approved. Do second. we have a second? Second. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. Now we're going to recess City Council meeting and convene the Housing Authority. And now I, I guess we have item, is it uh, one and two, Madam Clerk, on um, the consent calendar? We have um, the successor agency. We have three items on successor agency. All right. So let's go to successor agency. And I would uh, entertain a motion on consent calendar items one through three. So moved. Second. Those in favor, please say aye. 
Aye. Aye, those opposed, motion carries. We've done all our public comments. Uh, city manager comments, please. Thank you, Mayor uh, and members of City Council. Uh, we have um, a very positive uh, meeting with uh, a rating agency. And in the next day or so, uh, we'll hear wonderful news about Santa Ana, the leadership of the city, the management successes, our economy, our financial uh, successes, and uh, hopefully uh, that occurs over the next couple of days. And I want to thank the council for the leadership over the last several years to make this uh, remarkable turnaround possible. Thank you. With that, let's go to Councilor Tina Hedo, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to keep it brief. It's already uh, past 10, so I know everyone wants to go home and sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, but I just wanted to thank you, uh, Mr. City Manager, and congratulate you on your contract contract extension. Anytime you have a contract extension, it's, it requ it's a marriage. It requires both parties to be <laughs> to want to be a part of each other's future. So I appreciate the work that you've done. I'm looking forward for what we're going to do in the next few years, and so I just want to congratulate you tonight. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And um, I did want to make reference to something that, um, you know, in light of all the comments that we ha had earlier tonight on the um, the ICE proposal and to um, uh, to change and uh, modify and adjust that contract, I know that we have a citizenship fair that's going to be taking place in the city, and I know that we um, have staff, some of our staff, that's worked very hard on that, and I want to thank them. Um, I know Jorge and Julie and Mark Lawrence and others have worked uh, extremely hard on that. Uh, it's going to be April 9th, if I, if I remember correctly, and it's to bring and invite uh, the entire community of permanent residents that have lived here for longer than five years and been here who are going to be eligible to become citizens and hopefully get processed at that fair and be able to vote for the first time in the November election. So as we know, um, we want people to vote for you know, here we're not here to espouse voting for one thing or another. It's just exercising your right, um, you know, in our democracy. And I think if we can bring in a lot of new voters, it's going to be something that we can all be proud of, because we have a citizen, we have a citizenry of uh, many folks that don't exercise that privilege. And I think those new voters, those that are naturalized recently, are the ones that exercise that vote at a higher. Uh, proportion than uh, than those folks who've been uh, born here or raised here. So I'm excited because hopefully we're going to be able to uh, process a lot of folks. We have, I believe, those that are partnering with us are the Public Law Center, um, Accord, and others that uh, feel very strongly about making sure that you know we bring in new citizens and bring in new folks uh, into the voting process and uh, have them participate in our democracy. So. Thank you for that. I think that is, again, once again, April 9th, and I believe it's going to be at the Southwest Senior Center. It's going to be a great uh, location for that. And, um, uh, you know, to those folks who came out and spoke on this ICE uh, 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 contract, I want to thank them as well. I think everybody who came and spoke spoke very articulately. Um, I'm a little, I have some mixed emotions about this evening. I think that the public uh, really, uh, you know, behave themselves well. And I think that, um, you know, they're to be commended. Um, at the same time, I, I think that uh, issue that was brought before us was, um, was, uh, was somewhat sensitive and we should have had a little bit more discussion on it and I think a little bit more notice. So um, that and, um, you know, I hope that um, as we work through these next few steps, um, uh, you know, we went uh, out on a limb tonight, you know, and I think we took a big leap of faith both on projects and on, on adjustments on contracts tonight. And I want to make sure people live up to that. I want to make sure people are worthy of the faith that we've shown all our executives and all our directors. And I'm, you know, there are moments when I'm extremely proud of all of you. And there are moments when I, I do question um, some of those leaps of faith that we've taken because it's the public money that we're using to, de to, to you know, support you and uh, prop everybody up. And I think for the most part, it is, um, you know, we've taken responsible steps and we receive very many communications, I know I did, of people saying, don't do it, it's the wrong thing to do. Uh, you know, we're not in a position to be, uh, to be going and, and, and giving bonuses and extending contracts. And 
uh, doing different things like that. But we do it because we have an expectation. And I think it was spoken about tonight that, you know, we've come a long way. The problem is, is that when things get unraveled, um, when things get difficult, I just, you know, see some people scrambling, and that's not a good look for the city. And tonight, towards the end, was just not a good look. And it's, uh, it's unfortunate because I think we should be much better prepared to handle issues that are complex like the one that we've just handled, having to deal with the Heritage Project. And so I, I you know, want to compel you as, 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 as much as I can to make sure that, you know, the staff works together on these things. They give council notice on this. And if a, if a project's been in the pipeline since 2014 and we don't know what it is that we're looking at, boy, that's pretty disappointing. So I don't know where it's been and where it's been buried, but um, things like that shouldn't be surfacing after two years. So I, you know, again, I think that we, um, we're, we have confidence in, in the ability for staff to pull it together, but um, I hope that we do it um, we do it soon, sooner than later. Thank you. Thank you. With that, let me go to the left. Uh, Angie Mesquip, please. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to thank staff for hanging in there with us, long meeting, and our residents. Carl still here with us. Thank you for hanging with us through till past 10. But um, I do want to wish everyone a happy uh, Valentine's Day is coming up, and we won't have a meeting before then. So I hope everyone has a happy Valentine's Day. One thank quick, you. One quick uh, request. Um, I did get some emails with respect to the Santiago Creek cleanup that's going on in preparation for El Nino. And um, I, I, one of the things that was brought to my attention was the fact of the notice was a little bit short notice. So just in the future, we can keep that in mind. If we can give more advance notice to those residents when we're conducting those cleanups, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Reyna, please. I'm going to keep mine brief. Uh, today, uh, we celebrated my mother's birthday. She turned uh, 80 today. She looks absolutely fantastic. She had her entire siblings there, and there's 10 brothers and sisters. Uh, nine of them were able to make it on out there, so it was fantastic to see. And this was in the middle of a day today, at lunchtime. I go, don't you guys work? What are you guys doing here? Uh, but I, Mom, I love the heck out of you. Thank you for being the pillar of support and, and giving me the ethics and guidance that I have in the community to really uh, impact them, and I couldn't do it without you. So thank you so very much, Mom. I love you. Thank you for those comments, Roman. Councilman Benavides, please. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'll extend a, a happy birthday to, to Mama Reina as well for uh, raising a, a good kid here. I um, just want to thank members of the community who came out and participated in the, in the process, democratic process, giving us feedback, and, and it, it has impact. Uh, clearly, we were able to see that uh, here tonight. Uh, we have a, a strong, uh, hardworking uh, staff, a number of, of uh, significant projects uh, that we've uh, looked at tonight and improvements. I uh, just want to thank you uh, all for hanging in with us till after 10 o'clock uh, at night after a full day's work and, and uh, so many things that, that true all of you uh, do and, and uh, work. And it's, it's a, a strong team that we have here uh, supporting us and, and ultimately our community. And, and we're very uh, uh, proud. I'm very proud of, of, of all of your work, even if you just have two days on the, on, on the job. But that just means that you've got a high standard because folks around you are working hard. And so looking forward uh, to, to the work product there. Uh, I want to encourage folks uh, to make use of, of technology and, and uh, to uh, go on to our website and sign up for our uh, regular newsletters. Uh, we try to do the best uh, to communicate out to the public on, on different occurrences and information needs to be, uh, needs to be out there. So I want to encourage folks to, to make use of that uh, top right corner of santa-anna.org. You can click on and enter your email, get uh, information from the city on a regular basis, and also to download the, uh, uh, the, the My Santa Ana app uh, to be able to report needs that you might have, graffiti or pickup or of, of large items or a number of different things that you can uh, report. Um, and want to ask you to, uh, to support our local economy, support local jobs uh, and shop in the beautiful city of Santa Ana. Thank you. Have a great night. Thank you for that. Um, I just want to focus our attention to February 9th. That is when the president's budget comes out. And I'm very hopeful that our streetcar project is part of the president's budget. If it's not, there's probably not much we can do about it. You know, we sit and cry and wait another year, or try to get other monies from OCTA. But if it's going well, and I think it's going well, 
every indication I have is that it's going to be in there, and if it's in there, then our $300 million you know, dollar project uh, really goes on steroids. So I would expect uh, probably a press conference uh, you know, with OCTA soon thereafter, but I just want to let my council colleagues know that um, you know, February 9th, that's when the budget comes out, and let's hope that the president uh, put us in there. So with that, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>